here. This is Lamberson here. This is Morley here. Here. Mrs. Post here. Mrs. Russ here. And. You missed one. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> we keep trying, figure if we leave you off. <laughs> I'm still going to talk, talk whether they count me or not. Did you do this to me? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so just a, a note to the board members. So uh, this is Alessandra's first running solo without Lisa. Um, by her side to help uh, identify who be very and got the voice to the to the name um, so just bear with us and if I I've asked her if she uh, hasn't caught it just to flag me down so um, just please also be cognizant of that as we're going through things um, okay approval of agenda I have one suggested a revision which is to move item 15 nope Something's off with the Romanettes here. So it's the section called Old Business. Um, move that to immediately following presentations and reports of administration. So this is the discussion of new positions to be proposed by the administration as part of the 2020-21 education budget. So move that up to follow the presentations and reports of administrations and before the policies. So is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Yeah. Is there a second? Any, so that was made by John, seconded by Jen. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries unanimously. So on to um, celebrating our faculty and staff. Good evening, everyone. We um, decided Seldom am not am I heard. <laughs> um, so, like I was saying, we um, decided to rekindle our relationship with United Way, um, and that doesn't mean that we did not participate. It's just that we had a low, very low participation rate. So this year, we decided um, um, that we were going to encourage faculty, staff to donate to United Way, but they needed to know why. A lot of people think and believe that um, Cromwell does not benefit from the United Way, but we do. Not only our families who are in, in, in very much need, but programs as well. So um, I'm proud to announce, we haven't done this in a long time, but this year we raised $3,493 um, to give to United Way, which comes right back into Cromwell to support many different things so I'm very excited about this but I obviously could not have done this by myself um, we had champions at every school um, and this was a volunteer position they were our liaisons um, and they stepped up to the plate and so tonight I would really like to acknowledge them first um, it's not easy to talk about donating um, money and it's it's difficult to have conversations with people about what is this money being used for and how is it being used so these five stars um, they did it in their schools with the support of United Way as well um, so I'd like to acknowledge them this evening um, starting with um, ECS Peggy lower and Peggy did some not only did she <laughs> Peggy please stand <laughs> Um, She's supporting colors too. She is. I like the sweatshirt. I know. <laughs> I know. Not only did Peggy run and be the champion and the cheerleader for United Way, but she, uh, Peggy is an artist and she's our art teacher and she held a paint night. Um, and we, just the paint night alone, ECS raised $175 to donate um, to United Way. So she took her time and her expertise um, and, um, I think that's awesome. I, I really was so excited when she when she said that she was willing to do that. So thank you, Peggy. I appreciate it, and I'd like to thank you. 
personally. Okay, great, good. Great, I'm glad you like it because you might want to do it again next year. <laughs> And at um, Woodside Intermediate School, we had Erin Palmquest, but I'm not sure if I see Erin. No, she's not here. Um, Erin is our speech and language pathologist. She's been involved with United Way on the other end with supporting. Um, so um, she was very interested in help uh, in doing this and being the liaison for WIS. So I thank her as well. Um, at CMS, I'm oh, not sure. Oh, yes. We she may be watching. <laughs> she may be. I know. It's wonderful. Um, <laughs> at CMS, um, Maya Pavlik, and I'm not sure if Maya is here. Is she here? Where's Maya? She's hiding in the background because Maya is very humble. <gasps> um, <laughs> um, again, Maya was an incredible cheerleader, and we stepped out of the meeting. She said, I'm so excited that we're doing this, um, and uh, more than a pleasure to work with, and I thank you, Maya, for your support. Thank you. Um, at Cromwell High School. Yeah, we <laughs> Um, we have Claire Hatfield, and Claire was wonderful in um, making sure that people, yes, let's have Claire see the end, <laughs> um, that people had the right information. And everyone did a really good job, but there are a lot of questions when you're donating money. Where is it going? How is it being used? And so forth. So I truly appreciate Claire stepping up to the plate and doing that for us because we all know that all of these um, lovely women <laughs> are very busy throughout the day. So I thank all of you, and I'm extremely um, thankful to our community for being d generous, and I know that it'll, it will be used wisely to support our community. And district-wide, um, she helped oversee it, and Sil um, Sylvia Webb has been involved um, in uh, United Way for many, many years. Um, but I don't see Sylvia. Do, is she, no, I don't see her. <laughs> Sylvia supported us district-wide, um, and Central Office made donations as well. So everyone was involved. Um, it's We're trying to just get our participation rate up and um, really learn how to support and help our community. Um, so I thank everyone, and I thank every single one of the liaisons um, you are awesome and, and great to work with. So thank you. So just to uh, echo Dr. Macri, we certainly appreciate your leadership in this important effort. It's, it's important that we um, support our community in any way we can, particularly an organization that supports so many in our community in so many different ways. So really appreciate your stepping up and uh, taking on that uh, volunteer leadership role. So thank you very much. Celebrating our students. Is yes. that working now? Let's see. It's not, but you can use it. I don't like sharing my mic. <laughs> Chairman Camilleri just said he does not like sharing his mic. <laughs> I wanted everyone to hear that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So an, another, I know, had to, sorry. <laughs> he has a good sense of humor. Um, another wonderful thing that we do in Cromwell is PJ Day. So Pajama Day um, for our, our kids in Connecticut Children's Hospital. Um, most obviously, uh, when you are in the hospital, you are in your PJs. Um, and this, we've been doing this in Cromwell for a few years now. Um, and... We're working more and more districts keep signing on, but it's not just districts, it's businesses, it's partners, it's everyone um, across the, the state trying to show support for our patients um, at Connecticut Children's. So over the last year, hundreds, um, hundreds of thousands of participants have worn PJs in honor of our children at the hospital who must wear their PJs for extended periods of time while fighting cancer or other serious illnesses. Um, in my past district, we started it there. We had um, a teacher's son who and still um, is fighting and battling cancer, and but he's getting much better. And um, on Facebook, I posted, Cromwell is all in because he's spearheading it too. And he said, yes, um, but it wasn't me. Um, it's... I. They, I have to acknowledge um, Mrs. Cernacki and Sadie Budzik. Um, Sadie Budzik is our, one of our students at the high school. And not only is Sadie is not here because she has a basketball game tonight. However, Sadie's mom is here, I believe. Mrs. Budzik is here. Is she? <laughs> Mr. Budzik said, no, he's staying in. <laughs> 
I'm sh- Sadie does all this wonderful work because of the support that she gets at home, and that's where it does start. Um, she was incredible. She met with every principal. She came to a leadership team meeting that we held here, um, and she was very, very attached to this project um, as a volleyball player. Um, they did form a relationship with a, a child who had cancer that I learned about when I came here. His name was Axel, and he has since passed, um, and it hit the volleyball team very hard and it hit Sadie um, very hard and I I believe that motivated her even more um, to work on this project and what a delightful human being Um, and she's a young human being so if we could just raise more people like Sadie um, the world will be a better place and together we raised two thousand six hundred and six dollars and eleven cents so I do believe that if if it we wouldn't have raised as much as we did raise to donate without Sadie. So thank you for um, raising such an amazing person and for allowing us to educate her. It certainly sounds like we are also learning from her. So we are uh, definitely learning uh, from her. So Mrs. Budzik, thank you um, and your family and especially Sadie. And please give her thanks on behalf of the board too. It's It's great to see students at that age who appreciate that uh, there's much more than just serving what's best for yourself and looking out for others and serving the broader community so very proud of her and appreciate her leadership and look forward to hearing many great things for her to come so thank you they will for sure <coughs> okay. would you like me to go right into correspondence or no what is this oh okay yes uh correspondence please okay so um we were um Chairman Camilleri had, we talked about um, a family who donated $1,000 to help our lunch program for students who were unable to pay. Um, so a family did around the holidays donate $1,000 and then um, people started to talk about it on social media that they may want to contribute as well. So I, I did a quick little e-blast um, to the community and we did get two other contributions. So I would just like to read these letters um, to you. Um, Ethan and Jenna Bloom. Maybe don't mention the amounts, but just... Okay, got it. <laughs> um, we just thank them on the behalf of the students and um, staff of Cromwell Public Schools. I would like to extend our thanks for your generous donation. Your generous donation will support our food service program by reducing the overdue lunch balances from the Cromwell Public School students. We are grateful for your donations that will enable us to provide opportunities for students. Again, um, many thanks for your generosity. Sincerely, Enza Macri. And also another family um, are the um, Ona Hong, the Hong family as well, and they received the same letter. Um, so it was just something that happened and then it ignited some more support so we obviously will take donations to help our families who who do struggle um, a lot of our um, overdue balances don't always students families who truly truly struggle we do have free and reduce, uh, reduced lunch programs but we do have the reduced lunch um, you're still paying and then there are families that are just making it um, and sometimes they struggle with paying for their for their lunches and then there, there are just some kids that we have to stay on top of which we do <laughs> to pay their lunch but we do have a need um, so we are incredibly thankful to these two families as well um, and we um, We'll take any donations if you would like to make any. So <laughs> could I ask that in the minutes, uh, Alessandra, if you could make a note just to include directions on how folks can make those donations for anyone who hasn't Perfect. seen that? Yes. Just a nice reminder. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> um, okay, public comment. So there, before we read the rules for public comment, any members? Okay, so let me read the rules for public comment, and then we'll welcome you to the podium. Uh, we welcome and encourage public comments at our Board of Ed meetings to make sure that our meetings are conducted respectfully while encouraging public participation. We have the following rules for public comment, uh, four of them. Number one, individuals are welcome to address the board for up to three minutes during the public comment portions of the meeting, but board members will not generally engage in dialogue. The Board of Education Chair may at his discretion extend the time for public comments. Number two, speakers must come to the podium next to Mr. Flanders and share your name and address. Number three, to facilitate efficient sharing of comments, we encourage you first to share any comments you may have about instruction, discipline, or learning materials, first with your student's teacher, then principal and followed by the superintendent before bringing them to the board. However, if you do not believe your comments have been addressed appropriately, or if you believe they should be shared with the board for any other reason, please feel free to do so. 
And last but not least, all comments must not include personal attacks, and comments cannot be discourteous, threatening, vulgar, or otherwise inappropriate. The chair may, at his discretion, cur curtail any public comments or terminate any such individual's privilege of address if they violate any of these rules, reasonable standards of decorum, are boisterous or repetitious. And I will point out that uh, we are being live streamed, uh, which will include the podium. So thank you for coming. So again, name and address to start off, if you could. And is the red light on your microphone? If not pre on the uh, base, just press that. Yep. Okay. Hi, my name is Olena Stetsky. I'm the resident of Cromwell for over 15 years. And, and um, my and address is- Can I just have you spell your name <coughs> for the record just to make sure we okay. get it Okay, O-L-E-N-A, that's my first name. Yep. And then S-T-E-T-S-K-I-V, like in Victor. Thank you. And I live at 27 Winwood Drive. Cromwell and unfortunately I never thought they're gonna have to come here with um, hope uh, seeking uh, help from you because I came to a resolution that I didn't have um, resolution without principle from ECS in accordance to my uh, child's needs as uh, such as proper classroom placement for the her stability of her soul and uh, of course there is background of her family life and what was involved and not for the last five years and I did go into an extent uh, discussions with her at the beginning of the year due to the fact that when the letter was sent out that her teacher will not be starting her school and then coming in on board in October and now I got second letter that she's resigning for the short leave medical for the care of her baby I all understand but my <coughs> beginning of the school year concern was of stability of my child and that was not listened to me now that it's shown that I was right and I want my child to be placed in a different classroom that's it I think it's not hard I think for the sake of the lily child I'm the parent have a right to stand and um, demand that thank you very much for your comments I've asked Dr. Macri to get back to you um, at some point after the meeting Thank you. So thank you very um, much. But after the meeting, <coughs> perhaps next day, because yes, I don't want to yeah, stay tonight. here with the little child. Um, do you, you have a Yes. Okay. Yeah, not tonight. Um, later later uh, in the week, she'll get back to I you. I appreciate it. Thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate you coming forward. Any other members of the public who would like to uh, share any comments at this point? Going once, twice, go on. Okay. On to our student representatives. Who gets to go first today? Okay. Hunter, the floor is yours. The freshman class raffled off a gift card tree surrounded by generous amounts of candy in December. Students wore their holiday hats during the hat day on December 20th. The students participated in Cromwell High's first adulting day. They were able to take classes about auto basics, the college experience, financial responsibility, and professional behaviors. Student enjoys their, students enjoyed their 12-day holiday break. The 8th grade open house was on January 8th. Next year's incoming freshmen took a tour of the school, had an info session, and discovered Cromwell High's clubs and sports. More than half of the incoming freshman class was in attendance with their parents. Students will start midterms on Tuesday, January 21st. That's next week, which we're very aware of. <laughs> Ms. DeFiore allowed some student council members to have a meeting and talk about the semi-formal dance. They announced the dance will be on February 7th. Um, Hunter, I'd just like to point out, when you mentioned adulting day, you did not mention the contracts class, which I think was one of the more popular offerings um, during the I had the thought event. that would be covered in my, um, <laughs> the umbrella of professional behavior. Hunter, <laughs> the best class was interviewing and getting ready for interviewing. <laughs> we dressed up for you, Hunter. <laughs> you weren't there, neither of Clara, you were the there. the mic's you, Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Girls tennis had a meeting <laughs> on December 18th with their new coach, Miss Murphy. Boys basketball has a record of 5-2. Their last game was yesterday against Valley, and their next game is Thursday at home against North Branford. Girls basketball has a record of 5-3. Their last game was Friday against Canton, which was 48-29, and they won, and they have a game today. Do we have any update on the score? I'm not that good. <laughs> Fran, when you're ready, let us know. Back to you, um, Indoor track had a meet 
Uh, Saturday and yesterday, they performed very well and are getting ready for their shorelines and states. And hockey has a record of five and one. Their last game was on Saturday against Smith slash Tolland, and they won two to one. And their next game is in Cambury against Milford. Thank you very much. Who's next? Aubrey. Okay. Um, the CMS boys basketball team has had a great season so far with a record of seven to one. Most recently, they won their game against Durham. They plan to finish their season strong. The CMS girls basketball team played a tough game against Durham on Monday and unfortunately lost 32 to 45. The girls' record is one and seven. Both teams have six games left to play this season. Last month, the CMS band and choir hosted their winter concert. All grades participated with parents and family members getting to hear what all of the hard work for this first half of the year turned into. Some of the songs played by the band were All I Want for Christmas is You and Three Klezmer March. On Friday, December 20th, students in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade participated in the annual Reindeer Games. The students had a choice of signing up for board games, Elf Wars in the gym, karaoke, or video games. During Elf Wars, students participated in multiple relay races and had a snowball fight towards the end of the period. <laughs> At karaoke, students sang lots of songs with each other. In board games, students were able to play many board and card games together. The students in Mr. Kiss's room played a number of retro-styled video games like Pac-Man. The 2020 <laughs> ski club season final, uh, officially started on Monday, January 6th. During the winter season, participants travel to Mount Southington every Monday, weather permitting, and spend the afternoon skiing or snowboarding. <laughs> This year, the group has a wonderful turnout of about 50 members. Thank you, Aubrey. Paolo. The Cromwell Mill School Jazz Band and Select Choir Concert is tomorrow, January 15th. Both groups are made up of committed group, a committed group of music, musicians that rehearse for a half hour once a week before school. The jazz band will be performing Boogie Shoes as well as April in Paris. The select choir will be performing Call Your Girlfriend and Shake It Out. It'll be a <laughs> wonderful show. <laughs> Students at Cromwell Mill School were encouraged by the music department teachers, Miss Sales and Mr. Bergeson, to audition for Northern Regional Middle School Band and Choir. Auditions took place Saturday, January 11th at King Philip Middle School in West Hartford. Becoming a member of the Northern Regional Middle School Band and Choir is a huge honor, and those selected get the opportunity to perform with other musicians from around the state. The students are waiting anxiously for their results, will, which will be sent out tomorrow. The eighth graders visited the high school this past Wednesday for a high school open house. During the open house, students had the opportunity to meet teachers and hear about the topics they will be learning about next year. Additionally, students got to explore the school and get information about elective classes they can take and clubs they can join. This past Saturday, the CMS Robotics Club participated in a competition at the Mid Middletown High School. The team's ro robot needed to be able to lift cubes and place them in specified areas. Points were awarded based on the number of cubes the robot moved. The team did an amazing job but unfortunately did not qualify. Thank you, and certainly best of luck for those uh, anxious northern regional students awaiting the results. Got our fingers crossed. So any comments or questions for uh, any of our student reps? Very good reports, guys. Appreciate the info. You are, as always, <coughs> welcome to stay, but also welcome to leave at any point. We will not be offended. So thank you, guys. Okay, on to reports of the Town Council and Board of Finance liaisons, and we've got a nice full house of uh, representatives. So who would like to uh, speak first? Okay. My favorite kind of report, Jack. I hope I can be And favorite. if you could identify yourself for those watching in TV yeah, land. The, uh, my name is Jack Hennahan, and I am on the town council. And um, I can first say that this meeting is very different than a typical town council meeting. <laughs> um, in, in what ways, Jack? A lot of ways <laughs> that I do not want to get into, but a lot of ways. <laughs> a lot of ways. And any of you who have been to a town council meeting can verify that. Um, the bottom line is we uh, we didn't have any specific issues around uh, education except for talking about where we're going to be hopefully within the next six months thinking more about uh, school renovations school building costs 
and all those kinds of things. And I would suspect that a lot of that information will be uh, forthcoming over the next few months, as well as the budget, which is uh, which we'll be working on. And uh, I think uh, that all of that is going to require a lot of discussion. And I think also that we will hopefully put together a uh, a meeting like we did a few years ago with Board of Ed, Town Council, and Board of Finance to go through a lot of those. Yeah, and, and, and so uh, I'll share a quick update now, which is uh, officially laid on the agenda, but we'll move it up. So we did have a meeting of the um, uh, town's long-range planning committee, which includes leadership from the Board of Ed, Town Council, and Board of Finance, as well as staff members from the uh, Board of Ed and the town, uh, town hall, and the town's bonding consultant, and the board's um, uh, construction consultants. Uh, was it last week? Last week, time flies. Last week? Yes. Yeah, last yeah. week. Um, to discuss uh, notably the ECS uh, building project, the proposed uh, building of a new school that we have discussed from the folks in, in that room, and I'm certain they'll correct me if they disagree with any of my characterizations of the meeting. Um, I think we had a general consensus that there was um, support for moving forward with the process for this year to have it be considered. And the next step in that process after that um, meeting is to have a uh, joint meeting of the three boards, the Board of Finance, Town Council, and Board of Ed. So I'm working with uh, Chairman Netto and Mayor Fianza to work on scheduling that. We anticipate that will be occurring in February. Um, and then after that meeting, there are a variety of other things, including um, separate meetings from the Town Council and the Board of Finance, and then a special town meeting, which certainly could be adjourned to a referendum of the town voters all of that happening between now and june 30th uh, which is the deadline for submitting our application for state uh, grant funding um miss anything notable no i do if, may, yeah. please okay i good evening mr henny and first i would like to thank you <laughs> yes okay. and mr spots and mr netto um you made a promise that you would show up to these meetings to learn and and you are so to me i'm not just kissing up to you because we need money in a few weeks <laughs> truth not is not just <laughs> but the truth is is that you promised that you would come and learn and you have and so that is so impressive to me um because it means you care about our kids that you just heard speak um so i was I'm, i was so happy when i saw all of you walk in the door so thank you and i will on that note um you know we have uh the board of ed has been remiss in its in returning that favor um so this year we've done a couple of things for the uh board of finance uh catherine has kindly agreed to act as our liaison to the board of finance um so she'll be coming whenever she can and as a, a CPA, uh, I think it'll be helpful helpful connection between the, the board and the town and the board of finance. And for the town council, um, everyone was so thrilled by the opportunity that we decided to rotate it among all the board members. So we have a- I um, think that's wise. A, yes, so we have a, uh, nice. we have a schedule that we'll be sharing uh, with the mayor of what we anticipate attending, but we do anticipate having a regular presence at both of, of your boards to, uh, to help continue to build that relationship. It is unquestionably a two-way street and uh, we look forward to uh, um, serving our part as well. Speaking about schedules, just for one second, this is an aside. I was I went on the uh, town website today, and I was uh, looking for Board of Ed, and then I was looking for an agenda, then I was looking for any information, board members' names, something. I couldn't find anything. On the town's website. Yeah. So we yeah. should have We it. can have a link. Yeah. Yes, we yeah. can have a link to That's a very board. I never realized it because well, I was going to the board check site. And maybe I just... No, I bet you know. it's not there. So we posted on the board site. I bet there's just no link okay. back. So yes. maybe I think the easiest way is to do a link so we don't have to update both. Yeah. And Under uh, departments, maybe. So I think we'll work with the town, but I think wherever they have their minutes and agendas and membership, let's just link back to our website. Thank you. This That's took a feedback. lot longer than I thought. Yeah, I had no doubt. <laughs> um, but but thank you for the uh, website feedback, Jack. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. Who's uh, Who's got the... I guess I have... Okay. And again, if you could, Mr. Spots, just for uh, those who may not know your smiling face, introduce yourself. <laughs> Good evening. Alan Spots, uh, Vice Chair, Cromwell's Board of Finance. Uh, our meeting in December was very quick, which will probably be the last one for 2020. But uh, <laughs> the only point of uh, business was we approved a $20,000 DUI grant for the Cromwell Pol Police Department 
uh, that is reimbursable, but we have to come up with the money up front. Um, the only other thing what that is I'm, that fun, like the checkpoint stuff? Yeah, it's the checkpoint, and um, I'm going to guess it's going to be sometime in April or May. Um, and because of uh, legalities, they have to publish in the newspaper it always struck me as so where odd. they're going to do it, what time they're <laughs> going to do it. And, but they still get people, so it's, it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> make any difference. <laughs> they either get them for seat belts or uh, cell phones or whatever. And um, I don't remember the last time they actually got a DUI, but they usually get some type of an infraction. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to comment on tonight is the concern with the Red Lion. I don't know how many of you know that the Red Lion has closed um, as of Friday. And um, that's, some, that's a big hit to the, to the tax rolls for the town of Cromwell. Um, hopefully something can be worked out. Um, kind of like stay tuned. Um, I think it was unfortunate uh, that the town manager didn't know about the closing and all of a sudden here it is and I believe it's 55 people that are um, put out of work um, and then on the other side of it is um, Julius and I both serve on the Cromwell Fire District he is the executive director and I'm a commissioner the fire department's concerned about the building itself um, access um, people breaking into it um, to steal, there's still booze and food and so forth, plus yeah. all the um, equipment and TVs and so forth and so on. So We'll leave that part out of the minutes. Yeah, but I, it's just a concern that I think we have to, to be cognizant of. And, and did uh, we, so either on the town side or the school side, do we have any events scheduled for there? Um, any kind of forums? Does the only one I know of is the biggest one is, is the, the chamber. Middlesex cha yeah. Chamber. Yeah. I don't know where they'll find a space that can, you know, um, with that many people. So, yeah. but trying to get a question, comment for Ellen? Hit it again, John. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, can you help John? If I, if I could do anything, I wouldn't have had to go to law school. Uh, are they, has, has the Red Lion been delinquent in its property taxes? Not that we're aware, not that okay. I'm aware of. They have been, well, I guess, yeah. 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 They're not paying one. I have not heard anything. Okay. Uh, I've heard. Dates over the weekend, but nothing that was specific to that. Yeah. They would be due with a payment probably now. Yeah. And so the, they, they still, whoever owns the building still owns the building. Yeah. It hasn't been foreclosed out and turned over to the lender. So, sure. Do, if I may just, if I may briefly, um, yes, they are in arrears of the town. Uh, also, uh, any taxation, uh, any other the district, and as well as the, what forced closure was obviously Department of Revenue for the state of Connecticut, but um, they are behind the eight ball financially. That's the impetus for the closure, unfortunately. But as uh, I'm sure Chair, uh, Vice Chair Spots will tell you that, uh, what's at risk is well over two hundred thousand dollars a year if they don't open up. So uh, we're on, honestly, hopefully, they will get their house in order financially, so that they can open up not only reemploy the fifty people that've been laid off, but also become uh, because uh, it, it, we are centrally located. Uh, they do have, uh, I believe, I don't know the number of events, but there's a significant number of events that uh, not the town that we were engaged in, but uh, businesses were that they had to cancel find alternatives. So in any of those, obviously, it's loss of revenue, state as well as local. So it is a concern. Not the capacity. No. Right. I'm sorry. That's right. I'm sorry. We just needed to. Any, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Superintendent's updates, response to comments, etc. And anything to report? Um, just to keep it brief, <laughs> we will on January 28th be um, giving you a first look at the budget. We are working diligently. Um, I think my team. Um, especially um, 
Ann Burke, who is our Director of Finances, um, Carrie McLean, Michelle DeMauro, Tommy Latwinzik. Everyone has been, as Serial Larry, everyone has been amazing. Um, the principals have been amazing. I keep asking them to come back and tighten their belts and tighten their belts and tighten their belts. Um, and we will have a presentation for you um, on January 28th, and that's that'll be the first look. Um, it will be very, um, You'll have a budget binder in front of you um, that will give you the specifics. However, I will give you the overview by object and lines, and then I'll give you ideas of, so if you've never experienced going through a budget before, you'll see what is paid for in those lines. And then if you really want to get to the details, you can open your binder to that object code. Um, we will be doing those presentations. The administrators will be present um, so that they can answer any questions that you may have. Um, but I am looking forward, and we're working very diligently every day, um, every day uh, for the last, before we went on vacation, um, to get you the best numbers um, possible. Um, and I do believe you hired me. It's nice. I'm a fr new, fresh set of eyes. Um, so I'm coming in and telling you um, not a wish list, but what I believe is missing in the district um, and things that we could maybe do without for a little bit longer. Um, and so I am eager to share that with you on January 28th. And you'll be getting those binders to us beforehand? Yes. Um, today, Mrs. Burke and Ann Burke and I spoke about that today. Um, we're waiting on, we're trying our best to get as close of a number from, um, for insurance. So we're waiting on those numbers, and I'm sure the town is in the same situation. We're going to get as close as we can. Um, and then we also, well, we had a meeting, which is on my update as well, which is taking a little bit longer. I met with DACO today. Okay, um, just with the budget books? Yes. Can we try to target getting those to us on Thursday the 23rd, just so folks have time to digest? And do you believe? I, we definitely... Because listen, yes. I'd rather have them on Thursday and have not perfect information so everyone has a chance to read them because okay. I'd rather, you know, maximize maximize the time to review, understanding you guys have information to provide. Sure. And if there's an update, we'll just bring it with us that yeah. evening. Um, we did meet with Jacko today. And um, is that doable? Anne's nervous. I know you don't love the idea. Okay. Poor Thank Anne. You. Anne's been wonderful. Um, we've been very creative and problem solving and spending a lot of time together um, so we did um, I'm trying to meet with contractors and say this is too expensive we need a better deal um, what can you do for us um, we met with like I had mentioned uh, we met with DACO today they're a big contract and um, we're not up for um, renegotiating or bidding that contract until 2023 um, we threw out we're some always ideas up for renegotiating. we're, not we're up always up to I was let me tell you I was negotiating today I thought Ian's face was going to drop <laughs> um, but I am trying to do the best that I can do to to um, not spend money it's it's a necessity transportation is a necessity but it's incredibly expensive and there are some areas where i believe that we may be able to um really have a deep conversation about um so that we can perhaps save some money even though we do have a five-year contract with them um so we met with them today for a good hour um i gave them a number that i would really like for them to look into and um reroute all of Cromwell, do whatever you have to do, um, see if we can cut buses without changing bell schedules, without being um, a very long bus ride for our students. Um, I, we still want the service, but um, you know we, we need to look at some options. So that's happening. And I, I will say it's very important based on past times when we've tried to tweak it that we've gotten feedback about some of the unintentional <coughs> very long right. bus rides. Yes. Um, so let's just be very thoughtful. I don't want to nope. penny wise and pound foolish on those. So um, it just by way of historical perspective, that's been a, mm -hmm. if a not regular theme, but regular enough. Mm -hmm. Jeff. At our last meeting, there was this discussion about. Um, Is that not working? I think no, it's working. working. No, yeah. it's working. About uh, DACO having basically a right of first offer where we couldn't go out to bid. Did that come up in the meeting at all? Yes. It did come up in the meeting, and um, that was when. 
my negotiation strategies were coming into place. Yeah, let's just um, be careful <laughs> about what we share about <laughs> negotiation <laughs> strategies. <Yeah. laughs> it was. It was discussed, and it is in our contract. And um, we are looking at how we can mitigate that. But however, it is contractual, and we're they made sense. That. Yes, we're working through that. We're working. Th we are working through that. Um, and they will get back to us as soon as possible. As a matter of fact, when I was walking out the door to come here. I saw on my phone that we were getting a call from DACO. Um, so I know they're going back and doing their homework. Um, so hopefully we'll get some good news. John. So a couple of years ago, we explored. Can you pull the mic a little toward you? Sorry. Better? Can you guys hear? Blaze, can you hear him back can there? Can you hear me? This is usually normally not a problem. Yeah, that's what's surprising. It's like we have it muting you. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, there we go. It's, I'm shy. Uh, a few years ago, we had a committee that explored um, changing our transportation policy and encouraging more walking to school. Um, personally, I wasn't impressed with the solution that we came up with. Is that something that we might want to re-explore? So let me just ask before you answer. What what when you say you weren't happy with the solution? Yeah, the solution was we did we decided that everybody gets to ride the bus. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and that may or may not have been optimal. And, and if I could, just for historical perspective for those people who weren't here, one of the big challenges that um, the the committee found when they looked at that was. The location of the kind of these main thoroughfares with you know main street and route three court street and evergreen kind of you know surrounding all of our schools which just added some challenges to the to the discussion but certainly there are other towns where there's a lot more a, a lot more folks required to go to walk to school in, in closer distances so yes we can think about how much further we would want to extend our our lines of where we're picking um making them walkers however but to be legislatively clear, do we have any required walkers i don't think we have any required walkers in town no we um under legislation we must whether or not the students ride the bus or not so i can have and we know if you drop off your students um in the morning your children whether or not your child takes the bus through legislation, we as a district are responsible for providing a seat for them because regardless, no matter what. So what I, today was a discussion. Wait, how, so how is that? Because I know like towns like Wethersfield, if you I think it's like a mile even for middle schoolers that if you're a mile away they will not provide bus oh yeah we can extend the we can extend that but so for example but we don't have we, any walking zone required walking zone in Cromwell so no and that was a conversation that we had today as well um, I would like to see that happen the problem is and I used to be the person who would get in my car and drive out when the parents called um, in my last district we don't have a lot of sidewalks in, in Cromwell. So we can look at many different things. So for example, if we didn't just have, we, we do a lot of very close to your home pickups, which cost us money. Um, if we were to do... Wait, what does that mean? Very close, meaning basically we're, that are located we're next to the high school. We're picking, yes, we're picking um, oh, no, kids no. up right at their, right at their, very close to their door. We... <coughs> We can cut buses because you would need less because you can operate them faster. Um, if we were doing, um, so this is a bus stop and everyone has to get their child to that bus stop at a specific time. A lot of districts do that. Many, most um, do it. We are, um, we even do it for camp. We don't even do it for camp. That was my question to DACO today, which is unheard of. Um, we do door to door service for a lot of students. I'm not saying that our kids don't deserve it and we don't want them to freeze to death, but that means you're not getting something <laughs> else. Um, and so we talked about that today. Most is within a mile, and some are two miles. Um, we don't, we don't do that in Cromwell that is one of the reasons why our contract is a little bit higher we can talk about that um, but because if we can have a certain mileage of where we say no more you know we, we're not transporting but, yeah, but parents clear, can't just opt out like it would be great if i can have parent like mr camilleri 
drops off his daughter, I could say, Mr. Camilleri, sign here. You can opt out, and you're going to drive your daughter every single day. So now that'll minimize how many kids are on that bus, and then I can send a van out, which is cheaper, but I can't do that because it's a, it's, a, it's legislation. Yeah, and, and one of the problems, John, which you may or may not recall, is that when – when they did their report and when you, you put whatever mileage was appropriate for the, the level of the school, and then when you look at particularly Route 3 and, and 99, you then, you then were left with a very small population. And if memory serves, we, we, there was not a way to then structure it that, that the committee was able to discover that saved us a bus. So basically we'd have all these mandatory walking things, but it wasn't enough the way it was structured to save a bus. But that's just my recollection, it's been a few years. My, my personal favorite view of this issue was following a school bus one day, watching a child being dropped off at their driveway. Every three houses. <laughs> dropping their backpack in the driveway, running down the sidewalk three houses to meet the next kid who was let out <laughs> at that house. <laughs> that we, we could do a better job. Well, so let me just understand that. So if we, if we minimize the number of stops, we still have the same amount of kids so the only thing it potentially saves is having someone on the bus for an hour. Which saves money. Which could, as long as we have enough capacity on the bus. Yes. Because it doesn't, that doesn't cut down on the capacity itself. It cuts down on the hour the waiting time. Uh, which is the time is of the, that we're using the buses is, is costs money as well. So that they would work with that. They would work on that with us if we were willing to take that um, take that risk and I do believe um, I didn't have them look at that because I said it's my first year and I don't <laughs> want to get killed but it is something that we really need to look at as a board we are picking we are doing a lot of door to door and you're absolutely right John um, that that is happening and it could be something that I can have them look into so if we had fewer stops what would that look like um, and it wouldn't we, we would definitely have it would take there would be an adjustment period for sure but it would save us money yeah and i know you know personally and i know uh, at least a couple other board members we do not have door to door stops and it's worked perfectly fine i mean when i wasn't driving my when kids to school it worked it worked fine <laughs> selena i was just curious um are those door to door stops also occurring for the middle school and high school age or more so for ecs and wis because i could see that being an easier segue to start with the older kids it's across the district. It's across the district. Catherine. Is it required that we have sidewalks for the kids? Because other towns do not require sidewalks for kids to be, even to walk to a bus stop. No. There's it no is not a requirement. But being the person, it's it's very easy to say, and obviously student safety will always be, I'll always tell you what I think. It's not a requirement to have the sidewalks, and we can do it. However, when there's a lot of snow um, and the snow is pushed out, kids are walking in the middle of the road. Um, it is a big safety hazard. And um, I don't know all of Cromwell. I've driven many different looking for those sidewalks in some areas. I would not want to put our students in that type of situation. And, and to be clear, because maybe you disagree, I, I'm more concerned about sidewalks when we talk about forced walking to school rather than I am about walking to the end of your street yes, um, and true. certainly there are some places where that's an issue but like my little dead end you know right. on a relatively quiet street no no I don't care there's no sidewalks for, for it's a not, bus stop you mean yes. yeah, correct yeah, yeah. Okay. compared to the forced walking right zone. I, I just I know that in other towns my daughter walked a quarter over a quarter of a mile in kindergarten not in a sidewalk to get the bus yes. to go to school in kindergarten I came to Cromwell, this, it's ridiculous how our neighborhood was newer in Cromwell, 15 houses, one stop. They go around to the next cul-de-sac that has a, two cul-de-sacs that has about 15 houses, three stops. Yeah. Three stops for 15 houses. Yeah. It's crazy. Agreed. And they do not repeat <coughs> bus routes, so some kids are on significantly longer than others. I would be more than happy because today when we talked about ideas, I was reluctant for my first year going in. I gave them some ideas. They gave me some ideas. I'd be more than happy to call them tomorrow and say, can you please look into this too if that, if that is something that the board would support. 
Listen, this is my sense. It's certainly folks object. Chair, I think we should definitely look at it. You know, I shared John's, not necessarily his conclusion, but I was hoping there was a better solution from that, the, the way that group looked at it. And I know um, folks who were very supportive of it were very enthusiastic about it. So I think that they didn't feel like there was a better solution when it came to the forced walking issue. Maybe that's still worth revisiting, but I think even so, this just consolidating of bus stops could be could be huge and you know could allow to to solve some of these problems jeff and then lindsay so just to <coughs> confirm and clarify we're not talking about any changes for this school year no. this would all be for no, next year okay for this thank you yeah, lindsay so i just want to say i think that consolidating is great if you can but i think that it's very important to keep safety number one and to consider places that have sharp curves especially snow and stuff like that i'd rather have the kids safe than save a few bucks agreed strongly and and you know i think it's why there's not a i just want to comment on that because particularly lindsay and i are our neighbors it's perfectly fine where i am to do that where lindsay you know at the top of a hill very dangerous place and i think um i think we have to make sure that if we look at these consolidations that it's not some blanket answer of we're going to combine every 15 into one that we're looking at each of the stops and saying would i put my kid out there at that's exactly. at that stop and that um <coughs> That is something that is very, because it's very easy to say families would call me and I would be the one before we had a transportation person. And then if the transportation person said, no, this is still okay, they would send me out to, and I would drive it. And I would say, like I told you when I promised you the night you hired me, I would say, would I let my nieces and nephews walk this? And if I said no, I would come back and we'd pick the kid up. Can I see sure. hand over here? I apologize. It was me that you covered it. I just wanted to add on <coughs> what you were saying. I used to live on the street where there were no sidewalks, and it was so fast. Cars fly by, and when my kids were in kindergarten, first grade, or even now, I don't really want them walking up that street. So as long as it's case by case, like you said. Yeah, I, I Tipty. Um, I'm going to bring the mic down a little. I live on a very busy street, and um, even though there's a, student right next, there's a child right next to us, when there's snow, he cannot cross into our yard. He ah. can get on the bus. So. Yeah. They have to be, where we live it almost has to be door-to-door -door pickup yep and and i think that so i think that's a, a fairly strong yeah. message that mm -hmm. let's explore it let's see if there are opportunities but let's make sure that it's a, a a careful individual examination of the question um on that note um i'll just share uh something ends up started working on a little bit too you know there have been uh, a good deal of complaints and concerns around the intersection at uh, court and woodside and they, um, we had a, um, I can't remember what the police calls it, but the police department did a, not a stakeout, but a review Checking. of it during uh, busy times. A safety assessment. A stakeout, wouldn't it? Safety <laughs> assessment, better than stakeout. Um, <laughs> they, uh, um, and they determined that uh, it did not warrant uh, making it a four-way stop. So, you know, we've continued to have concerns um, about that intersection and listen we respect their decision on that and and we know that's not not going to happen in the in the near future so uh dr macri and i've been looking at the possibility of crossing guards for that site in particular we've had some feedback from folks that there has been some interest in volunteer crossing guards so we've been working with the town uh notably the town manager to try to explore that understand what the um requirements uh, around that are i think uh Weathersfield uh, has a crossing guard program. They shared some materials, so we're starting to review that to just kind of understand if there might be something viable to explore there um, to just help out with feeling a little more comfortable. Rocky L does too? Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. They volunteer. They volunteer. Say again? They, volu they volunteer. I'm sorry. In Rocky Hills, do they do volunteer? They volunteer? I think, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I think Weathersfield does, and they go through, because the, one of the real risks is around, you know, making sure we're not causing more issues. And as I said to, to, to Tony, listen, right now we've got kids doing it on their own. It's hard to see how any crossing guard would be a downside there. Um, and, and so we're just trying to, working with things like how does that impact insurance coverage if we have folks acting even as volunteers on behalf of the town. So there are various things like Weathersfield, and I haven't reviewed all the materials, but basically a training program and quasi-certification to make sure they, um, you know, are uh, background checks, whatever it may be to kind of build that. So we'll continue to explore that and see if that's a, a viable option there to provide some additional comfort and, 
uh, safety at that intersection. Anything else on your updates? Just the last thing, um, we are doing um, our second larger walkthroughs. Um, myself, Dr. McLean, will be walking, um, doing two-hour walkthroughs in every school with the principals and the assistant principals or any instructional leader at that building. Um, and what we'll do is we'll visit classrooms for about 10 minute clips and we will look for trends. We use uh, a rubric to evaluate our teachers, but we're looking at what the students are doing and obviously um, more focusing on instruction, not the person, but the instruction and what looking for patterns of what um, we can improve on. And then we will sit and have conversations together, meaningful conversations on how we can improve instruction um, in the classroom. So th those will be happening in February and March. Um, and. Uh, eventually we will move to something called instructional rounds and when we get to that point next year um, we'll start small and I'll explain to you we will explain to you Carrie we'll, Dr. McLean will explain um, <coughs> what those look like so we're really looking for patterns of um, instruction that we can improve upon in the classroom and then what type of professional development and resources we would need in order to make those improvements and I think the rest is I in our, my weekly update <laughs> so I'll, I'll just make a comment on that. So, you know, one of the things we have intentionally as a board put a hold on was our own visits to the schools, um, uh, you know, in part to just let things settle down, let uh, let you, um, you know, work with the, the, the teachers and staff. So what I'd ask um, is that we start giving some thought as to the best way to ha allow each of the board members, I know we can come anytime we'd like, but I also don't know that that's helpful for our our schools for our staff our students and for our educational experience i also don't want to do you know stage dog and pony shows where we you know everyone spends hours prepping for us to come but i do think it's important for us to um, rethink about what's the best way for us to get into our schools in a way that doesn't interfere allows us to see um, and have uh, you know hands-on experience and visibility to what's happening and what I'd ask is that um, you work with the various stakeholders you know all of our you know staff and faculty leadership and our administrators to um, figure out what the best way to do that is so we can get that kind of experience and understanding in a way that does not adversely impact our students learning experience or cause a lot of wasted effort for um, things that aren't helpful any comments, questions, thoughts on any of that? Selena. Just one quick suggestion. When I went to open house at the high school recently, I thought this would have been good to have come many years ago just so I could see what goes on at the high school. So I don't know if that would be helpful. And that's probably the only school that would work for because I don't think the middle school, do we do one in the middle school? I don't remember. Um, open house where we went class to class. So I don't know because we could kind of blend in. That's yeah, no, it's fair. Good evening. I'm Ann Burke, Director of Financial Services. Um, the booklets that you have are, um, the smaller booklet talks about our federal, federal grants. They're both from our auditors that come in and spend a pretty good amount of time with both us and the town looking at everything. And from year to year, their audit requirements change. Um, but the smaller document has grant information in it, and the CAFR report has um, all the town departments and the Board of Education, a lot of information in there. Um, so those are what those, those two reports that um, our, our SM auditors have provided for us. And, and so I'd encourage folks to take a read through them. I do not expect uh, that folks will be reading every footnote, maybe Catherine, but the rest will not be <laughs> reading every line of these, of these documents. But certainly take a look through if there's things that you have questions about. If you'd prefer a one-on-one -on -one tutorial, I'm confident uh, Ann and Enza can kind of help walk you through anything, any questions you have or 
um, anything else, but I do think it's helpful um, to at least have a basic understanding of what's in these documents. There will not be a quiz, um, but certainly encourage you to at least take a, a, a breeze through. Um, so I've um, asked that included in your board packet is just a kind hey, of a snap. Can you bring the mic down a little bit? Things are very quiet today. I don't know if I'm. Is that better? Get yeah, a little closer. Um, so this is just a snapshot as of the end of the year where where we were with our budget. Um, so we have about two hundred thousand dollars that is unencumbered at this point in time, which I do anticipate that we'll spend. I do think we we'll, we are going to have another very tight budget year, um, but I'm keeping a close eye on everything, and I anticipate that. Uh, we will certainly do whatever we need to do to make sure we curtail expenses where we need to and um, spend where we do. Um, at this point in the year, um, I s really start going through aging reports for all our open purchase orders throughout the district. And um, in the next week or so, I'll be contacting the schools and making sure that the purchase orders that they have requested up until this point in time um, are the correct amount. They're not too low. They're not too high. And um, by repeating that process multiple times from now until the end of the year, we make sure that we really are keeping tabs on um, what we are spending and what we need to spend to complete the year. And are there particular types of aging purchase orders that cause greater concern or warrant greater visibility, or is it just across the board? They're all important. Um, we, because of the volatility with um, special education, we spend maybe a little more time reviewing those um, because that can change. A child's IEP can change. Um, we're actually hoping to consolidate maybe some a transportation for one student, so that will help bring down our costs. So if we if we know that that's going to happen, we will adjust the purchase order um, for Dadco uh, to reflect that. Gotcha. Um, but you know, even the small ones can be important too. Yep. So. Um, with um, Luann, who works with me, she does AP, myself, um, we do spend a good amount of time making sure that that's, that's our best source of um, how to track what we know is there. And also, I'll have discussions with um, Sari O'Leary and um, with every uh, principals to make sure that if they know of something that's not on a purchase order, they need to communicate that to me. And so we can talk about it, decide if it's a priority, and if we are, in fact, going to encumber the money. Excellent. Thank you. Comments, questions for Ann at all? Jen. I was just wondering what falls under the category of other professional technical services. So other professional technical, 330. Yeah. This, is, um, this is mostly legal expenses. Um, it could be um, some other, ca I have my budget book here if you want more detail, but the bulk of it is legal expenses and services that we need from outside the district. It could be our, our auditors and things of that nature. All set, John? John. Not surprising that our legal expenses were a little over last year. Uh, I, I was mostly concerned with um, instructional supplies and other supplies and materials that there seems to be a lot of money left over there uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's left over um, some things are time sensitive so for example your science departments won't necessarily order the supplies they need for certain units of education until later on yeah, but um, this is last year Pardon? We're ta I'm talking about last year's report. There's thirty thousand dollars of no. This is current year. Oh, this is current year. This is where we okay. are right now. Oh, okay, never mind. S then I withdraw the question. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> Selena. Line three twenty three pupil services. I was just wondering why it would be negative. Are we expecting um, money returned to us or? Um, we do get some money back for pupil services. Um, so we are, the, in the encumbered and forecasted column, we do expect some money back from, um, so pupil services, we could be getting reimbursement from Hartford for services that we provide to their students. 
So at this point in time, it looks like it's coming back, but we do know that student, there will be additional services. So if you look at the last column, that number there, I do expect that we will use those funds throughout the course of the year as different you know, evaluations come up and different needs in the special ed department. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay, thank you very much, Ann. Much appreciated. Sure. Um, uh, Chairman Neto, just a comment that um, Ann and uh, Dr. Macri are gonna reach out to you probably sometime in February to just kind of talk through the plan for the Board of Finance presentation. Um, you know, last year I don't think things went as smoothly as we'd like, not the fault of uh, Chairman Hanahan or the members, but I think our, our approach and leadership changes and the like. So we just wanna um, have Dr. Macri and Ann kind of meet with you um, and, and probably Mary Ann too and just kind of talk through the plan, the materials that we'll plan on sharing just to make sure that there's alignment and, and we give you guys what you want. Okay. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. I'm just curious. I more than happy. Obviously, we're more than happy that to do that. Um, would you like to have? A, I don't know if you'd like to have a, bo a a workshop ahead of time to understand a little bit more. Or do you want me to just come in and? I think just that, well. I would suggest so. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was Mr. talking. Mr. Chairman Neto. It's okay. He's, he's talking so to me. It's two, okay. <laughs> yeah, two quick it's things. It's okay. It's Let okay. Me, can I take? Yes, take may, you may. So two things. One, I think the meeting I was talking about was with the the three of you, yeah. just kind of talk, and four of you maybe with Marianne, just kind of talking through yeah, logistics. Correct. Um, your thought, Julius, on whether before the actual budget presentation, and you don't have to tell us now, you can get back to Dr. Macri at any point, if it would be helpful, particularly for Dr. Macri, but um, certainly in as well, to come before the Board of Finance just to introduce and say hi and get to, um, or do you want to all at the budget meeting? So just give some thought what you, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me know when you want to go and I'll join you. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll let you guys get back to uh, your planning session. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> you may. Sure. Okay. Or you could introduce her. No, no. I <laughs> know. Someone else said that the other day that they called the Vatican and they got a hold of the Pope faster. <laughs> it was Sal Neshi, I'll have you know. So he may have said that, yes. <laughs> okay, anything else on that topic? Okay, so we're now going to move to the item we moved up, discussions of new positions to be proposed by administration as part of 2020-2021 education budget. Um, and maybe just uh, for those who may not have been there, if you can kind of recap um, what's bringing you back. Yeah. So quickly at our last meeting, um, we did talk about the new positions that we that we were asking for in our budget um, and there were uh, quite a few questions about mm -hmm. why do we need um, more social studies teachers at the grade six level um, at the middle school and um, we had asked um, you had asked for a presentation and um, Dr. McLean and Mrs. Cochiola have put together a presentation so that it, they can explain to you ex um, how the, the middle school is scheduled uh, is um, impacted. Imp yeah, exactly. By the lack <laughs> Thanks of for the word. Those by the lack of those. <laughs> th thank you for filling in my thought process. <laughs> so go ahead. Good Floor evening, everyone. Ann Cochiola, and I'm the principal of Cromwell Middle School. Good evening. And um, I did receive the questions that you needed some clarification on in regards to those positions. And I know Mr. Flanders had asked for a pictorial chart, so I did my best, and I'll go through the chart for you. Um, also, the questions um, regarding why social studies teachers and not an additional English or math, and also um, 
why just social studies teachers and would that put us on the same par as seventh and eighth and that's where I'd like to begin if you look on your first page and I'm getting to why we would desperately love to have those two social studies teachers currently our school is set up in teams our seventh and eighth grade teams are comprised of four content area teachers ELA math social studies and science and we're very fortunate that we have full teams and what that does and allows for personalization for our students. Sixth grade, due to um, a variety of reasons, there are, three, there are two three-person teams, which means each teacher, the three teachers on the team, teach their content area and then they also teach a social studies so, for example, Mr. Messenger, give me a little wave there, Mr. Messenger, teaches math, um, three math classes, a social studies, and then now what we've implemented is what's called our focus period, and I'm going to explain that in a moment for you as well as to how that impacts sixth grade. So, each team member, as I said, teaches that one social studies class, and all the teams have a special education teacher um, that supports all the kids on the entire you know grade level so before I go into how the impact teachers for sixth grade will happen for us this well it's happening now and also for next year I just want to give you a quick background of what do we mean by a focus block we got together this summer teachers um, administration and we talked about how can we help our students um, improve upon whether it's skills or how can we help those students who continuously show growth and um, you know skills that they don't have to necessarily focus on but develop even more so so we've developed a focus block which we meet weekly and determine kids who need help within certain skills or we want to provide those students extension activities for those who um, are just chugging along and they're doing great and we want to now challenge them in their thinking within the classrooms. So we're building that this year and we have again our core support or our enrichment activities and our enrichment activities tied directly to our core classes our curriculum we also are very fortunate we have a reading and math intervention staff two teachers that address our tier two and tier three intervention which of course by state we have to have that because we need to have srbi um, which is to help kids who um, aren't functioning um, well at just tier one which means they need the help and support so we can provide them that extra support in addition to their language arts math science and and social studies classes so if you go to the next page where it says grade six so this year as we were creating that focus block um, we had it um, balanced by our four teachers on our um, content teams for seventh and eighth grade but sixth grade they were short two positions to be able to round out the focus block like the other grades so we had our math and reading interventionist um, function on the team on the sixth grade teams to also provide that enrichment and that core support to our students in sixth grade and if you go to the next page where you see this um, kind of a balancey beam I'm going to explain to you um, why this is not um, the best case scenario for our sixth graders because our intervention team our intervention time excuse me is impacted due to the reading and math intervention is teaching a sixth grade focus block the kids are still reading are still getting their skill development but that took our reading and our math people out to help the sixth grade team with their intervention and enrichment blocks yes uh, I'm sorry can can you give an example because I'm very confused on, on how the I understand that you provide either core support or enrichment mm -hmm. but I'm really confused how it's working through what you're explaining right now it's um, the coverage of those periods so the, you need some right. teachers okay, to cover enrichment going, yeah longer. here you go you need some teachers to cover enrichment and you need some teachers to cover core. Because there's not enough teachers on that sixth grade team, we need to use our math and reading interventionists to cover those periods, which means that they are not providing necessarily, they could be providing enrichment. They're, we're not using our so interventionists the way that we could be using them. They're not, they're not supposed to be working with the core support then 
as interventionists? What are they? We really need to pull those kids and have them okay, be working so in tier two groups. Okay, so what do the seventh and eighth grade programs look like for it? Well, they because they have the four person teams. So you have your language arts, your math, your science, and your social studies teachers that comprise of their focus group. So they teach the support and the enrichment because they have the four core teachers. And they, this way we could divide the kids evenly or determine which kids needed, say, science support or social studies support. And when I say that, I say skills within those classes. Okay. Because we have the four teachers, we were able to evenly distribute the students and have even numbers. And then the reading and the math interventionists pull kids during that focus period to add additional support within the reading and math instruction. So now sixth grade, because we didn't want to overburden their classes, you know, because there's only three core teachers, that we added our math and our reading interventions to help support. So they're also supporting kids in the social studies component of it, whether it's skills, you know, learning to read primary documents or text evidence, so forth and or um, project based within our enrichment piece but by asking them to support us there they're not working with the kids at that time specifically for reading and math then they pull them at other times but not during that time does that make sense so can I interrupt okay. just quickly they sure. lose 10 and this um, I'd like to look at it. I love data. So they lose 10 blocks right. of intervention time. Correct. So when interventionists who we have trained to be interventionists, they're certified teachers to work with students that need tiered instruction because they haven't, um, they're struggling in their core, their, their tier one. We, these people now have to cover for and, and support the teachers. So that means they, it's 10 blocks of intervention a week that is lost and there's right. two teachers and it's 42 minutes so if you do the math that's 420 minutes of intervention for our students who are the most at risk and we know that as they go up in grade um if we don't catch it's it's truly i mean it would give us grade, more right? spaces to pull more right, kids pull more kids for and, intervention i think my, that i think my initial understanding of focus was incorrect and that's what's oh okay causing the problem okay and then, can um, can I finish the other? Or do you need, no, go ahead. Sure. But I'm understanding. Yes. Essentially, you're taking people who should be doing tier two and two, tier three interventions and having them spend more time on tier one. In, in, my, as, in those, we're filling those focus spots with them because we're missing those two people. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we're filling those two spots that are missing with those two interventionists so essentially we're putting them we're inserted putting them in the focus blocks when they could be doing what we need them to be doing which is more, intervention more specific intervention. Yeah, personalized intervention with the kids okay. on their skill and, and they're still working with the kids whether it be some skill development and also but they're also now working with enrichment where we could scoop up more kids for intervention so that's why the two social studies teachers would round that out for sixth grade and give us that um, expansion of working with the kids um, and we also as it says too, the class sizes are larger due to the distribution of classes you know such as the sixth grade teachers as I explained before teach three core classes one focus and one social studies class and also when we get into leveling of math classes that throws off numbers so by bringing in those other two teachers it would even out our numbers of students per class there's also a there's also a bubble right now in fifth yeah, grade well, coming up that, yeah nuts, so yeah. <laughs> the bubble is causing an even bigger problem for next year because we still like those class sizes are going to be exceptionally big because there happens to be what 30 169 students coming in this up class from which just happens to be a to bubble class grade. coming through okay. mm -hmm. so it's looking ahead also to um, working with that and making sure we get those numbers evenly distributed and because as, if not next year you know we could feasibly have 28 kids in a class in sixth grade and that we don't want to do so that would have us then go back to the drawing board and look to see what we can 
how to tweak the sixth grade schedule in order to make things you know more evenly distributed students wise and also our social studies teachers are just a huge um, foundation for literacy and and uh, reading and writing and they also support our students immensely um, and that's not just within content but also within the literacy skills as well so that's why I'm there's a much bigger mm -hmm. focus on I know <laughs> <laughs> plus Anne's and I'm like hey, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a much bigger focus on social studies standards now we have mm -hmm. a c3 framework there is a civics component to it there's much more inquiry based learning it is a much more specialized field and you know our our ELA teachers they're doing a great job but they don't have the specialty in social studies to really be hitting that inquiry arc the way that we really need to be in order for our students specifically to get those civic skills and those participation in you know town and city and you know all of those things that they need to be doing there's just not it's we just don't have the capacity to, to do it the way that we really need to be doing it there's there's something to be said about um, the content specialists so that there can be some focus on so, those skills so may I um, we're not doing anything illegal because no. uh, we <laughs> are legal Lee um, you are allowed for example I'm a mm -hmm. k3 cert pre-k3 certified person with the certification that I have so I can teach yeah. up to eighth grade they've changed it I'm a little bit older now um, so there are teachers with four through six certifications, and obviously those are the teachers with either MICER or a four through six certification. K six, yeah, right? They K six. K six. Mm -hmm. They're allowed mm -hmm. to teach. However, we can't. Um, it's a it's a little bit easier to be an expert in grade one and two when it comes to social studies and science, um, math. Even it becomes much more difficult as the years progress, um, and we've noticed that in one area where, just to give you an example, we have. Um, Mr. D'Elia um, at Woodside Element uh, Intermediate, specifically teaching STEM science and then working with the teachers to provide them science extensions of lessons. And this has been happening for about three years. And you can see the difference in the science, the NGSS scores, um, and obviously science, social studies, but where I'm talking about the expertise. Um, the middle school rocked it. Is it, the middle school teachers did a phenomenal job, but the kids came with more of a foundation versus in the high school our NGSS scores in science um, were not very um, good and and I truly believe that having that found those foundational skills those teachers with those ex that expertise um, when they're young makes a big difference and that's where we're at right now with social studies um, in the sixth grade my, my main concern is obviously with that bump is having 26 students in a 20 Eight middle school mm -hmm. Next year students in one classroom mm -hmm. um, is very very That's difficult, right. and um, and the and the rooms are they're not they right. they, they can't really handle the size of twenty eight. So we would have to look at definitely um, modifying the schedule. And so what's what's your take on how the focus focus block is that the phrase focus block is working as it um, I've asked students I've asked teachers as a matter of fact just at our last faculty meeting we vetted the schedule we did a, a um, an activity where we looked at different components and um, there are those components that are working very well within for example the seventh and eighth because they have that directed laser like vision of what they have to do the kids like it um, it just becomes more of a challenge within the sixth grade because they're they're changing up and what's your sense of what the kids like about it well the kids like the fact that they have access to their teachers during the day they absolutely get that extra help or they get that that opportunity to go do some extension activities that they normally wouldn't get to do um, you know throughout the day so it's a very valuable time period and it's an instructional time period it's not wasted it's not um, you know a, a study hall it is where the kids are building their repertoire of skills in a variety of ways okay. Catherine um, for this focus it's different than flex yes but how mm -hmm. do you determine core support may be easier to recognize than enrichment how do you determine what to do with kids who don't need core support but need enrichment 
We spent um, over the summer working with a staff to um, come up with some baselines of what we use to determine that. And right now, and we're certainly working with um, Dr. Macri and Dr. McLean and building up those baseline, you know, data points to work with. But we use SBAC, we use our STAR, we use our common formative assessments that the teachers utilize and then they start to look at even classroom instruction they look at their classroom assessments and they say hey you know what this student is across the board rocking it we're gonna you know continue with enrichment in all the content areas and it's done weekly the teachers meet weekly to determine how is the student doing is the student still performing at this level and then if not sometimes a kid who's doing exceedingly well may need a little more support in reading those data uh, types that they're doing in science because science is a challenge you know the NGSS and sometimes kids bump into there and get some support there it's just a way to really we're working towards really personalizing students education and it's going to take time and we know that but we're that's where we're starting we have an excellent structure yeah, um, people covet the structure that we have with the exception of this for a middle school it's incredible and um, Carrie, myself, and, and Anne have so many amazing ideas of how to really um, improve the resources and support mm -hmm. at the middle school because, frankly, they have very few. Almost, I, um, We have amazing teachers at the middle school and amazing leadership because I cannot believe they've done what they've done with the little that they have. So that is my focus or our focus as a district is making sure the middle school gets what they need so the students are not just compliant but they're engaged. Um, and the way it's structured with this exception, if we had to change it, um, we can do a lot with blended learning and individualized learning because it is a perfect setup. And in most districts, that is not the case. So we're halfway there. Um, if we can get fully there, we could create, um, mm -hmm. honestly, I believe, uh, Right, the, the, it's endless the what we can do. The you hate part. the microphone. She does. I'm gonna kick you out. She doesn't like to listen. <laughs> no, she'll I don't. Do it though. We'll talk. <laughs> um, the structures are the hardest part, and we have those, and so I don't want to see those go. The programming, we can do a ton of things with. I mean, the curriculum wise, we can build a curriculum, we can get inquiry activities in there, we can get um, project based learning in, we can get some personalized learning programs in there. All of that's going to take time to build capacity with teachers and do some professional development. We've talked about some great things that we could potentially do. It takes time, it takes money and resources. Um, but the structures are the hard part, and we have those. So I'd hate to see that go. I think a question or comment from Dipti? Um, I think you answered it. I was going to ask how those extension activities, like how many of them um, involve student development? student how, activities yes yeah, that's that's where we're go that's where we're going with those you know so that there's more choice in voice in what the kids are doing and they can choose what they'd like to research and and those types of things and and so we can head in that direction because we have this time that we can allow them to do that in as a matter of fact our seventh grade social studies um, they have developed uh, our own student debate teams and we've actually had some of our students and it's in a very small place but it's going to grow um, kids are actually going to compete down in Wilton going to compete in Glastonbury and they've been doing that and that and that's been the foundation through the enrichment classes in the seventh grade so that's the kind of um, learning we want to really incorporate into our um, into our school thank you any other questions, comments, thoughts? Okay. Thank you guys very Thank much. Thank you so really much, Really appreciate all. the uh, information. Very helpful. No. No, it's just a pre-discussion before the budget. It'll be a part of whatever ends up coming in, in that. Okay. Um, first read of policies. Uh, Jeff. So these are mostly in the uh, students' portion of the policy manual. Um, Again, more up. Oh. We can give you two. <laughs> I can't hear you. I took his mic. So, again, these are first read, not up for um, action this evening. And I would welcome any comments the board has uh, now or outside the meeting. Any immediate comments, questions for Jeff or the rest of the policy committee? Jen. 
Sorry, I'm going to keep being a pain about this, but it says guidance. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Office. Which In the first <laughs> one, equal education opportunity. Which um, policy, Jen? I'm sorry. Uh, personnel certified, non-certified, non-discrimination, equal education opportunity continued. Oh, okay. So, so it's that mm -hmm. it's the third, third page. It's the third page in oh, right of the there. first okay. policy. So I'm sorry, Jen, uh, which section of the policy? Third page in. Right here? Yep. Third page in. So right above discrimination grievance procedure? Yes. Oh, Forms okay. are available yep. in our I guidance see, office. Page. We need to like. I need to go through all of you. Yeah, it's the global search. Right. It's the glo so. What happened? Remember when some of the words were missing? So this was our second version. So we gave you the second version, but I forgot to go through all those. I will. I'll and fix then, all of them. Sorry. So it should be other. guidance officer. Should be what? School counseling. School counseling office. And then um, on the next page, it says complaint shall discuss the alleged complainant shall discuss the alleged discriminatory act or practice with the civil rights officers or the individual closest to the daily decision making level this normal this will normally be a principal teacher counselor department chairperson head custodian or cafeteria manager i just was questioning why they would discuss it with a teacher or counselor wouldn't an issue like that generally go to an administrator So it's in our district, we, um, it would go to the principal and it would go to a civil rights officer. Um, there are times that people do go to the school counselors or had whoever, depending on who it is, but in a district our size, it would most likely be the principal and then the civil so rights officer. So should we refine that? Um, it sounds like it's not inaccurate, but it's also not the way we'd like it to be, maybe? So it's it's like going to the person who has... Um, but if there's an alleged discriminatory act or, or, or practice... The, f the, first r you, the very first level is to go to the person who is closest to the situation. Um, and have a conversation because it doesn't always um, I'm trying to give an example without giving any names um, having a discussion about the discriminatory act but then that person saying I don't really want to do anything about it right now because it's not so bad I just want to put you on notice um, and then at that point the school counselor or the head custodian, if it's a head, someone that someone feels a tr is trustworthy, um, will then say, "Okay, but I'm mo we we should bring this to the principal." Or they would say, "I wouldn't because they're the closest to it." Yeah, and but it to be clear, once sound. they once they put them on notice, they're on notice. Yeah, and they we are. can't just the 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 person who's being reported to can't just say, "I'm not going to do anything about it," even if the individual wants them to in many situations. <laughs> So what right. I think what I think the risk is with this approach is you've got too wide a of population of potential people who are um, basically uh, unofficially or officially accepting notice on behalf of the district and putting it in a place we don't want to be. Right. It is it is the person who's the closest to the daily decision making level. So we could, Michelle. I just I know we talk about this a lot. Like you go to the person that's closest to, but this is after the procedure has started like the grievance procedure is in action now what you mind come up, coming Michelle? to the mic because <laughs> i understand before it becomes an actual grievance but we should probably look at yeah because this is level one yeah, of this the is procedure going through like going getting A principal, administrator, or who was the third one? Ah, okay, okay. I I would leave it at administr in in our district. It would be, yeah, principal, administrator, because it could be an assistant principal or director. Yeah, that's fine. And and so it's the first sentence is still the same, in that it's the civil rights officer or 
the any of the following closest to the decision making level administrator director or principal right So, so you, the civil rights officer should be first renamed, but second, not in level one? No. Level one's always your lowest level. So anytime you have something going on, you want to resolve it at the lowest level. Um, so usually it's a principal, a director, or an administrator. So if a parent's having an issue, a parent can go to their supervisor or their director, their director would be uh, Director Sarah O'Leary. So they could go to Sarah Rigo, they can go to the principal first. But to be clear, though, we, I don't think, and tell me if you disagree with this, I don't think we should mandate that they can't go to you. No. If we do it the way we're talking about, I think that sounds like it might be. Right. So I think it should, I think we should say in level one that um, they should go to their principal administrator or director, or if for any reason, you know, they're not, uh, whatever language you want to use, they're not comfortable with that approach, they can go to whatever we're using in lieu of civil rights officer. I think. I, th I think you're correct, and I think leaving it the way it is would do that. Yeah, but I think we can get rid of this individual closest. I think that's just confusing language, and let's just simplify it to say, you know, oh, just get rid of A, that. B, C, or D. And and what what's the phrase in lieu of civil rights officer? It's uh, human resources. She it is. It, it would just be confusing because people would ask, "Who's the civil rights officer?" But the tr if they're the same, she is the civil rights officer. Yeah, but should we, um, and Jeff, John, you as may know as well, should we put a sentence in here somewhere that says, um, f because I'm guessing civil rights officer is a phrase used in, the, in some of the legislation or regulations that we say the civil rights officer for purposes of the Cromwell School District is the human resources director? Sure. Yeah, we could do that because it is the official. John? Oh, sorry. Is your mic on, Michelle? Hello? Doesn't, Doesn't sound, sound like, like it. Okay. Thank you. So if you go under where um, the, on this page before, it's under employees wishing to discuss these regulations or rights under this policy, the need for reasonable accommodation or wish to discuss or file agreements should contact um, the Director of Human Resources. Who is the, di yes. who is the District Civil Rights right. Coordinator. Right. That should officer. be worded right there. Maybe we should just put district here. Just as a quick question, would it be hard in the packets that go out in the policy section just putting page numbers on the bottom? You know what? Handwritten. I was thinking the same yeah. thing. You just read my mind. Yeah. We will do that. Or you can do that. You can do this at night when you're bored. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still getting wow. good. I we can't don't prohibit you from having a social life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> wow. I know I had to because it's it's confusing. Even though I've read them through, I still get confused too. Okay, so Jeff, do you have what you need? Mm -hmm. Work for this. Okay. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? Um, what did I ask before this comes back for a second um, second read, Jeff? Let's just make sure that uh, Enza and Michelle both signed off on it. Okay. Any other comments on any of uh, the policy committee's first reads? Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Hearing uh, none, we go on to the second read for possible approval. Jeff, did you get any feedback since our last meeting? No. Okay. Um, any? Uh, is there a motion to approve all of the second policy? We have a comment from Jen. Go ahead. Um, sorry. No, no, uh, please. Sec it's M, which is it says at the very top, reference S. Uh, so wait, M, M as in Michael, 6159? Yeah, individual education program, special ed program. If you look in the packets, it's, it says reference S at the top. Reference S. So let's see where the heck that would be. 47.3. Uh, no, uh, it's reference S? Yeah, it says reference S at the top. It's P6159. Oh, it's the first page of 6159. Yeah. So, oh, okay. so I actually need the second page, B, 
just um, adding just school in front of counselor. <laughs> school. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna keep doing it. No, we're with you. So uh, th the first full paragraph after the note? Right, mm -hmm. in addition to the above, the special education specialist, yep. Over to the left, Jeff, second line. Yep, yep. What is school counselor. Just adding school before counselor. Oh. Sorry. It's all right, no. Consistency and appropriate titles are helpful. John. This is yet another of those policies that actually mostly quotes existing statute. And I'm questioning whether or not we need to have a policy in place when we have a law in place. And I noted that there are two changes in the policy that reflect changes in legislation in Connecticut. And if we have a policy, then we have to revise that policy whenever the legislature decides to act. So normally, I strongly agree with that philosophy. Let me, let me play a little devil's advocate on this one, because this one strikes me that this, this is helpful for parents and guardians who may not necessarily be aware of the statutes and it's at a place that's easily accessible to them. That's my only thought, but I generally agree with your philosophy very strongly. And let me say, as someone who spends his every day yeah. teaching parents about this particular section of statutes, I have in 20 years never heard a single reference to school policy. So, I, I know, Mr. Flanners, we will continuously have this conversation. <laughs> um, so, basically, it is a mandated policy um, to it's have. It's not mandated that we have a policy. It's mandated. This one is, yes, this it's one's mandated, mandated policy. policy, yes. Meaning the statute says we have to have this policy? Right. This, these are just ones to consider, so we came up with it. But yes, everything here is mandated um, no, but like, that so we do have. So whose note it. is this? Because this, the this Cabe says it's only recommended, which seems to align with what John said. This is um, from Jessica. Yeah, so Jessica. Jessica says we mandated. have to have we this must. policy. Yes. So we had um, our yeah. council go through, and this is just one that we can consider to use. That's what they mean by this recommended policy uh, to consider okay, okay. to use for a mandate. So Cabe does that once in a while but my main concern there's two main concerns and what I'd like to do is um, I even as the superintendent I don't know all of the uh, legislation out there by heart there's so much and so much changes so frequently and um, our administrators can't keep up with it our parents definitely can't keep up with it and even if they're looking at legislation it's very difficult to read so when it's broken down into policy I could tell parents where to go and then I can offer them support on how to understand it so because they're I I'm working with it much more than mo your typical person and you're working with it way more than I am Mr. Flanders however the general public doesn't so it's nice to have it's it's important not nice it's important to have it um, where it's easily accessible for parents and stakeholders to know where to find it so although I agree with you I'm not a lawyer though so I I want I would like all the policies readily available for administrators and for our um our families really the most yeah and so we can uh, refer I, to so i get it i do uh, it, it pains me to say it twice i generally agree with with john about the hesitance about it because one of the big gaps and we certainly see it when you have too many policies it becomes less likely that you're going to update them to reflect statutory and other regulatory changes and then you have a policy that's not helpful because it's not as updated as it should be so i think you know it just if we're going to follow that philosophy it just makes it even more important to make sure we have a robust system for being able to track changes and be in in real time and i know yes. you know we've been on this project to kind of catch up so but i don't want to lose sight of everything else that we've caught up on that we don't fall behind on that again 100 percent um it's mandatory i take things you know that are mandatory very seriously from the state department of education from legislation um, and I will definitely every time there's an update or change um, it will be brought forward to the policy committee but let's make sure um, my and I don't want to rely on you seeing a bulletin somewhere about oh it. So no we get make it sure from we've Kate. got a robust yes process with connectivity with the policy committee yes absolutely 
Alice. Selena. Thank you. I don't know if we talked about this, and maybe this um, wouldn't work, but could you just put a link to the um, actual regulation or whatever it is, the legislation at the bottom of the policy so that if someone needed all the most current information, Our they could click on it? Our policies would comply with the statute. Click here to see it. So, so um, that would be wonderful, except for we are so shorthanded to begin with. My goal by the end of the summer is to just have our policy on our website that are all updated um, with our recommendations and our forms um, to then have someone link everything to those because there are so many policies. No, but to be clear, what I think she's saying is we still have a policy called IEP number whatever, but the policy says our policy is that as required we comply with content stat section bingo and here's the link. No, I get it, it but that takes That's a body yes. Do this though. This this will already be on. This is the policy. Yeah, yeah. But think about how much time we're spending even doing these edits. When if we the policy were just one line, it would be much easier and accurate still. But not legal. I don't know that that's true though. It's if our do we have to have when she says it's mandated, uh, and maybe I just don't know. Does it say you have to the policy the state statute says you're required to spell out all of this in detail? Or is this, in fact, mirroring the state statute? And we could just say our statute, our policy could say we comply with the statute as required, our policy as we comply. Okay, I hear you. Um, so what happens with statute, it could be we're pulling out the pieces so that it's easy for people to understand and conceptualize. If we put links to just um, statute, people could be reading for hours upon hours to pull out. And if that's that's the case, then I'm yeah. more lean to do this. But if this is if this is a restatement of one or two statutes no. largely, then I don't love the. Sometimes idea. they get stuck in the middle of others. Jeff's got his. So just a, a couple of things from the the policy committee and any other members feel free to to chime in. But I think as a committee, we've generally taken the approach that. You know, in some areas, less is more, and if there is a state statute on point, uh, we may not necessarily need, need a policy at the same time unless, you know, board council tells it's otherwise mandated. Um, so generally, I, I think I agree with Mr. Flanders as well, and the committee has uh, uh, also. In terms of the legal references, at the end of the policy, for example, this page, which has uh, letter H at the top, uh, there is a section of legal references which, you know, I think there's not one particular statute that governs here. As we see, there's four or five. There's also case law. There's public acts. So, uh, you know, to, to, to have one link go to the statute yeah. is, yep. you know, there's a, there's a lot is my point. So, okay. um, but I think even the, in the past, we've even had a scenario where we said, you know, our policy is to comply with conjun stop blank and I've just left it at that. Whether there was, there was a link, I don't recall. But yeah, and, and so if that's right, because, you know, certainly you could have legal references and it still could be that this policy is just citing from one, one of them rather than mm -hmm. multiple ones. If that's the case, I, uh, for this one, I support it. I just, let's continue, and it sounds like the policy committee is aligned with that general philosophy, but I, I personally want to, more is not generally I, better. I, we, we agree. Okay. John, do you withdraw your objection on this one? With with caveats. <laughs> Duly noted. Uh, oh. The two cap the two caveats. Oh, are, I didn't think you were going to tell me what they are. Were now. First, no, first off, one. It would be nice if all of our policies were available online. They're going to they be. And, they, and, and if and you're if you well you no know, agreed and that's been a, a mission of of Dr. Macri's after and discussions I, and I appreciate that yep. so I'm supporting that. Uh, second. Uh, I don't know what page it is, but subsection B, Romanet 3. What policy, though? This is an IEP policy. So we hold on. Let us all flip there. It's, it it's one of the highlighted sections. Page C. Yeah, page F. Yeah, F. Page F. Okay, the Romanet 3 at the top? Yes. Okay. Jeff, did you find it, Jeff? Yes. Okay. I will bet you half of my board of ed salary that that will change this year i'll double that bet no um <laughs> i'll change it as soon as okay they're, 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 it's pretty it's pretty clear that they're gonna 
remove the language about autism out of that, and it will be for everybody. Caveat duly noted. Huh? For everybody. For everybody. Okay. I'll find out. Perfect. Perfect. Trust me on that Siri one. Run, Siri runs uh, right in. <laughs> and, <laughs> and on page G, the highlighted section, uh, uh, that will probably also be amended uh, ex to expand the number, the students who are requiring those communication plans from depth. The last depth sentence would be. So, okay. so the caveat being, it's fine that we have a policy on the understanding that we will almost certainly have to change it in six months. And, and Sarah Nenz, I'm guessing John will be on top of this one. He's already got on his calendar to uh, check it. So. <laughs> Don't worry, John. Let's use uh, this I, I even know I'll be right I, there with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Dipti's got her eye on it, and too. And say, well, so. I'll be right there with you. Um, fine. Otherwise, fine. I withdraw my objection. Okay. Any caveats duly noted? Any other comments, questions? Hunter. Um, item D, reference J, if you have page numbers, I think that's 30. Okay, so hold on. <laughs> item D, reference J, so this is 4211.1. So yeah. just give us a moment to get there. 4211.1. Wait, where did it go? Is that a typo somewhere? 42, why am I not finding it? Wait, the affirmative action one? Yeah. Okay. Okay, hold on. If you could just give me one more second. Oh, 4211.1, reference J. Jeff, do you have it? Yes. Okay, Hunter. There's just a mechanical, um, a parenthetical in there that starts but never ends. Oh, ah, <laughs> good catch. It would go to the, the end of the sentence. The never-ending parenthetical. Oh, yeah, yeah. Starts including well, it should just end at the end of the it, sentence. It, um, oh, got it. If it does go to the end of the sentence, then that's also... We need to look at that because that would include sexual orientation in a list of disabilities. Oh, yes. Very fair point. So gender disability. So I think it probably, that parenthetical should end after disorder. Oh, yeah, I see. I think it should end after disorder if. Yep. yep. Hunter, does that sound good to end after disorder? Does that? Yeah, that sounds fine. Yeah, no, appreciate that. Uh, important correction. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll point out the policy committee does have two lawyers on it who did not catch that. So, um, three. <laughs> I'm not oh, on the policy committee. Oh, yeah. but you read it. <laughs> yeah, but I, I figured it's easier to blame guys. I'm not on. Of course. So, thank you, Hunter. Any other comments, questions before we put that up for a vote? Okay, so let's vote um, on all the policies under the second read together, which is uh, A through N as in Nancy. So do we have a motion to approve? Motion. So where was that motion from? Catherine. So we had a motion from Catherine. Do we have a second from Lori? Any comments or questions otherwise? Do we need to know which ones were amended? Um, so it, we're approving A through N as amended. Jeff will make sure we've got the amendments for the minutes. Is that fair? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries unanimously. And again, special thanks to Hunter for uh, catching us on that uh, important typo. Okay. Moving on to board reports. Policy committee, anything other you'd like to report? Facilities and Technology Committee. Chairwoman Kelleher, anything to uh, share with the uh, full board? Um, we met tonight. Um, we were given updates about various projects ongoing, and um, Mr. Kimaleri gave us an update on the ECS building project, and that's the topic for future agendas is more updates on the ECS project, and our next meeting is April 7th. Did you want to add? Um, yes, yeah, so the only thing I'll add is we did look at, um, kind of similar to how we looked at the new positions um, as the full board before, the Facilities and Technologies Committee tonight looked at some of the facilities proposals um, that came forward, facilities and technology proposals. Um, I think generally there was alignment. Um, one of the issues to follow up was around the tennis court repairs, which had been removed from the um, kind of proposed budget that's going to come forward to us just to make sure we understand are there other alternatives and or are we kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by causing additional costs to need to be incurred going forward. John. 
Um, could we get copies of that distributed to the whole board? No. The exhibit? Um, yes, no, we can We could certainly do that. Um, the facilities. Yeah, the facilities, the packet. whole whole packet with all the references. Thanks. And what you'll see in it, just by way of explanation, is there'll be, um, sorry, I got a leg cramp, the um, original proposal that was what, um, it's quote unquote original, it's what Tommy pared down based on everything he got. He then presented an original proposal. There's a revised proposal, which is Dr. Macri's further um, paring down. Just by way of explanation, so you see what you got. Um, okay. Included in references that went out? Yeah, so it would. Does that go to everyone or mm -hmm. just parents? Yeah. This went oh, out to. Yes, yes. Yeah, so John would okay. see that. Yeah, so anyone who's a parent, you would have seen it in the posting, but um, just if we can get it to everyone, just to make sure everyone sees it. Okay. Sure. You know, and that's actually a good point um if we have board members who aren't parents who aren't getting that can we just add them to that distribution list sure okay okay um aren't parents of students currently I, in the I district was the <laughs> actual <laughs> <laughs> the actual point <laughs> john. yeah is it just john it's yeah. just john so I, add john I, I, I'm used to, I'm used to that was actually the nicest thing i've said to you in a while um, so we okay. talked about the ECS <laughs> school building project. Was there any questions on that and where we are in that? Uh, I, um, yes. There I, was a lot of discussion, but please for newer board members who were not apprised of some of the discussions that had happened, the new ECS, the reasons why we were talking about talking points, and yep. Yep. can you board distribute board. that to other board members so that we're aware of? how we got to this point in the first place? So I, I know, I feel like you, Catherine, two, like two months into it, I'm like, there, what do you mean there's a building project? Mm -hmm. um, so we know, we know there's a project, <laughs> but we don't know. No, I didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so, the, the, so we'll do the presentation. Yeah, and I think there's two points. So the, to Catherine's point, and, and Catherine was uh, kind enough to join us as well, um, and Jeff, that the um there's going to be talking points and to be clear these aren't like political talking points to you know that 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 congress is doing but there'll be kind of a uh, a a list of the reasons why that'll be shared with the board of ed the board of finance and the town council so um you know so there's alignment and, and a, a better understanding from all the players about why this path why new building versus rehab, YECS versus CMS, kind of all the, the pieces of the puzzle. Um, and, but I think a second piece that may be helpful and maybe kind of what you're alluding to outside of that is kind of what's the, you know, and you know, Tommy's probably the, probably the best resource is, you know, here's where we first started talking about this, here's what we're thinking about then. Nothing, I'm not gonna spend hours on it, but just right. kind of a sketch of, you know, here's the timeline. I know CSG is in part looking at that to try to make sure we've got a good path to understand the dollars and how they translated, but I think just a, a high level kind of timeline about what we started with and where we are now, I think it'd be helpful if I'm interpreting That's right, cool. Catherine? Yeah. Okay. I know, we had that, it's too bad we had that presentation. Yeah, no, it, we'll get, we'll work through it. Anything else, Catherine or Jeff, to add on the uh, ECS schooling building or Tommy or Enzo? W one last. Yes. Um, I got an inquiry a number of years ago. We put uh, solar panels on the roofs of two schools. And if we could, as part of this, let folks know what will happen to those <laughs> solar panels as the result of the renovation whether we're going to replace replace them and i know what we had talked about that tommy anything you want to share and if you could would you mind coming to the uh, mic <laughs> now if i can recall uh Paul Suso was involved in a lot of this because Eversource was obviously involved in how this was all going to happen. I believe we discussed with CSG that they were going to incorporate new panels in the building of the new building because it's not economical to take the old ones off, try to store them, they're going to get damaged, and they're old technology. 
but I know there was an issue with the uh, grant that was awarded for those panels. So there's going to be some kind of, you know, um, some kind of accounting for that to fix that one way or the other. And I'm not sure where that where that is. I know Paul was leading on that at that time. I'm not sure who our contact's going to be to to, to resolve that. Yeah. yeah. So if we could just make sure we um, uh, have that question before the tri board meeting to the extent possible, if we have that answered. I'm gonna try. No, no, no. I understood. <laughs> it's in I've February. I understood that, it, that it's not the the single biggest element of the project, but no. It is, and 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 we do we do reap a lot of benefit from those solar yeah, panels. I'm just wondering about repurposing them if we're going to replace. Them. I don't think it's going to be economically feasible. Okay. I really don't, uh, okay. and, and, and that was Paul's view on it originally. So uh, we can we can ask, we can inquire, but it's just that I know the uh, little known fact about uh, the inverters. You know, the, the entire pro the total panels are good for about twenty five years. Uh, the inverters are, are, are good for about ten. Yeah, and we're at nine and going on ten. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's expenses we're going to incur shortly on these. So. It's timing is well for ECS, but we're going to have to do something about middle school. Yeah. I mean, putting up one of those garages where you charge up the teacher's electric powered cars. Yes. <laughs> was the suggestion that I got. Thank you, Tommy, and You're thank welcome. you, John. Um, okay, next. Um, and you'll see what we've done with the board reports is we've kind of got the, the A and B, the, the two um, major board committees, C being the school building project will keep us recurring. And then thought just for ease is we'll then put the district climate committee and to the extent any board members attended, they can report on that. Um, and then E will encompass any other committees or appointments that uh, we'll just open it up to the floor. So did anyone from the board attend the district climate committee most recently and want to comment? Yeah, please. So I am on that, but the, they go from 2 to 4, and I can't get there. I got there at, like, 2.45, and then it ended at, like, 3.30. So I wasn't – yeah, they just broke into groups, and do you want to tell what sure. they did? Yeah. Sure. Um, so we, what we're doing is we're breaking into groups by our goals. Um, at this point, the team um, has developed goals, and what are we going to do – now that we have developed those goals, what are our theories of action? Um, what are our action steps? So theor theory of action is what is the adult going to do in order, if, if the district, if we, um, the responsible parties, um, provide whatever the adult needs, what is the outcome going to be for the, the child or the student? So um, that's what we're, we've developed those. Now we have action, uh, action steps, and now we're looking at um, timelines for when we are going to do what because this isn't just we're not just going to change everything overnight this is going to be a three to five year process so that was what we did and we talked about um, feasibility um, we talked about what were um, we brought knowledge and ideas from two different teams together and we looked at what did we see that both people um, both committees had in common so that when we develop a, um, a plan of how to move forward it it's not just a plan with from one committee or another committee quite a few committees have had input and then of course it's going to be brought to you um, for final approval and I would like to have that ready so that you can see um, the alignment for um, the alignment to the budget because there'll be direct alignment from our district improvement plan to um, our, our budget so you'll see that um, very soon too as well thank you okay. appreciate that any other committees or appointments anyone wants to share anything from anything they've done okay uh, on to new business approval of the minutes and motions from the December 10th 2019 meeting do we have a motion to approve I just saw a typo do we okay. care about that yes we do care about typos oh. so tell me <laughs> so under under public comment at the end when Mr. Delia spoke, he's from Newtown and it has says lives in Newton, so I just want to change it to Newtown. I just that just jumped out at me. So um do you Oh. So uh second to last page. 
Yeah. Yep. At the end, the public comment at the end. Do you see that? Yep. So just change it to new town. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Lori. Um, any other comments and questions? Do we have a motion to approve the minutes as amended by John? Is there a second? A second by Lori. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed and abstentions, we have Lindsay and Mike. So Lindsay and Mike abstaining, everyone else approved. And we'll just wait a moment, good? Okay, next is to entertain a motion to approve the motions and minutes from the executive session from December 10th. Is there a motion to approve? We have a motion from Dipti and a second from Jen. Um, comments or questions? Motion to adjourn to executive session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, no worries. Any other comments or questions? Made by Matrulo, but you don't think that's right? I'm not sure. Do you think it's you? Okay, so we'll correct that to note Mr. Flanders very rare motion into executive oh, session. Oh, you did it on purpose. Yeah, no, I have, I have no doubt. Fight motion oh, duly okay. noted. Yeah, Is there a vote to impeach member Flanders? <laughs> um, nope. So, um, <laughs> so uh, is there a motion to approve the motions and minutes of the executive session as amended? So we have a motion from John, seconded from Jen. So we can scratch the first motion. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? So Lori, Lindsay, and Mike. Wait, I'm not noted as absent. Nobody even cared that I wasn't there. Nobody thought you were. Um, so if, uh, we don't have to vote again, but if you could just add me to the absent list and Lindsay. Nobody cared about us. Selena didn't care about us. That's <laughs> okay. Blaze, you're last man standing. You beat Mr. Neto. He caved. Um, okay. Uh, stipend approvals reference X. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Oh, we have a question. So when we um, when the environmental club came in for to ask for funding they said that they were combining the sixth grade tech club with seventh and eighth but i only see seventh and eighth here i don't think they've changed anything the on it i think they just need to so they should add sixth grade there yeah, right so where it says tech club it should right. say six seventh and eighth yeah okay so let's uh reflect that change any other comments questions before we entertain a vote so uh, vote to approve these stipends as amended, adding six to the tech, tech club. Is there a motion? Made by Jen, seconded by? Second. By Jeff. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention, motion carries unanimously. Okay, on to uh, two informational items in your packet. Any members of the public who would like to comment? You, uh, you may. And uh, I think probably everyone knows you, but if you wouldn't mind identifying sure. yourself, Mr. Messenger. I'll push my button. Oh, the button's on. Yeah, I'm Blaze Messenger, uh, 12 Goodrich Avenue. So, uh, yes, I, I can complain that my taxes are too high and that my salary is too low. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I teach sixth grade. Uh, I've been at the middle school now. This is my sixth year. I'm a grizzled 16-year veteran, I believe, of the Cromwell Public Schools after having taught fifth grade for many years where I taught Hunter everything he knows. Ah, so, well done. Expect, there you go. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, here to, I'm here to amplify, to add to, to Mrs. Cochiola's comments about adding the sixth grade social studies positions. Um, 
there's one resource so money obviously is a very precious resource in education there's another one which comes into play here and that's time uh, we have six teachers core uh, correct core academic teachers in the sixth grade seventh and eighth have eight which mean and we all have about 150 kids it's remarkable how steady that 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 enrollment stays but that means depending on how you calculate it we have between 25 and 33 uh, percent less people working with the same amount of kids which means those kids are getting 25 to 33 percent less time from us we have our classes are larger we're averaging about 25 this year seventh and eighth grade are averaging about 17 or 18. that's additional seven or eight kids is a huge difference in a classroom so we are not able to take advantage of what the focus provides simply because any progress we make in the core support is negated by the fact that our classes are so large and we can't get to everybody in those 40 some odd minutes so um and I would argue that sixth grade is the biggest change in education other than going to kindergarten and going to college. As those kids move from fifth grade to sixth grade, that's the whole, their little nest that they're in in fifth grade, they're, they're in the same room to this, we kind of throw them in the pool and see if they can swim. And our job as sixth grade teachers is to give them those water wings to help them. Uh, but because of the numbers, and the lack of time, it's very difficult for us to get everybody. And that's when they're starting that secondary school journey. That's when they're getting those organization habits and those, those self-independence habits. And if we miss them because we can't get to everybody because there's only six of us, it carries on and on. And so this is impacting not just the sixth grade, but going forward. Um, and we also, and then again, with the extra class, we teachers are doing more preparation work. We are preparing an additional lesson in an additional subject beyond our core. And that, and it's social studies because it's our only one of, we only have one of those, it becomes a second tier subject. It's, and it's not on a, because we don't want to teach it, it's we just don't have the time. I'm teaching three math classes plus the, the focus class. So that's at the bottom of my list. And as somebody, uh, the C3, the new social studies frameworks that came out several years ago, world culture is the sixth grade subject. And if you turn on your news, you can see that many of the problems are because we don't understand what other people are, we don't have any comprehension or understanding of what other people are going through in our own country around the world and that's our job as educators to help them learn that that's what world cultures are and if we're not giving them the full complement of that I feel we're not doing our job and it, it breaks my heart to teach a social studies class that I can't fully I don't feel like I'm giving them the full Mr. Messenger which uh, which Hunter will say is uh, can be a little overwhelming so um, <laughs> So I, I, I just, I can't say it enough. We, we've been doing this for a while. We've been down the two teachers. Uh, it's not fair to our students. It's not fair to our, to our world, to our future. I, I, I ask you to please consider adding those uh, and, and giving us the shot, to give those kids the shot to be the best person they can be. And, so. and Mr. Mester, we are gonna, if you don't mind, uh, we may have at least a, a question or two. Sure. Um, but f uh, first, beautifully said, and very much appreciate you uh, hanging you. around to share those thoughts. And for wow. those who uh, were not aware, uh, in addition to being a, a veteran of our schools, he, I think, was Cromwell's only statewide teacher of the year in 2013. So we're looking at a, you My know, picture's a, on the wall in the library at Woodside. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, the, with the then president. <laughs> so it, uh, you know, we certainly appreciate and value your, your input, Mr. Well, thank you. So a question from uh, Catherine. Yes. I'm very glad that you stayed so you I, can answer. I wanted to see what you guys do every <laughs> month. <laughs> <laughs> um, Don't tell anybody, right. please. <laughs> so, so my question is, the looking at the numbers, this was, um, this was presented as a need mainly for focus is what I was understanding. Well, it, it's, it's, it's not just, I mean, that's where a big impact is, but it's everything. It really is. But the, the uh, yes. And so how, is there any difference? I understand the curriculum's diff maybe slightly mm -hmm. different. I also know that they're increasing the, um, the social studies curriculum 
at the lower at the WIST level yeah, too. Yeah, that's my understanding. Um, so the teachers are teaching more. Mm -hmm. But how is this different numbers wise than the class that came through three years ago? That's uh, larger than they this gave class. us an extra social studies teacher that year. We had seven teachers that year, and still some were teaching social studies in addition. To uh, having yes, Mrs. we were, but we had there. but we had the one point person, much like mentioned somebody mentioned Mr. Delia being a point person for science. And Mrs. Delarada. Mrs. Delarada, but then. If I may say, we had two retirements, one in seventh grade and one in eighth grade. And, and they only replaced that with one teacher. And sixth grade was the one that lost the, the position, even though it was a seventh and an eighth grade teacher. So they took that teacher away from us when the numbers went back down to 150. Right. So if we get this, uh, I'm saying 28 to 29 next year, if we kept the schedule and staffing the same, and that's really not sustainable. Uh, it's not sustainable to take sixth graders and have 29 of them in a, in a class and get any, and be able to reach the kids that really need to be re reached. Right. Um, I, I came from, Cal I used to live in California. My son was gonna be in a, was in a, a, a fourth grade class with 30 kids. His fifth grade class was gonna have 36, and we said we can't, you know, and he, he, was, he has autism, and he needed special attention, and he wasn't gonna get it. So we said we gotta go somewhere else, and we came to Cromwell, and I, I got a job here, and I, and I liked it, so we moved here. We bought a house. I have parent conferences in the Stop and Shop. So um, I see you in there having parent the, conferences. Yeah. So, uh, so I we came here to get away from that, and it, it, I, I I I I fear that if we're going, if we're looking at just the money of it, um, something needs to be restructured, or positions need to be added, or moved around, or shuffled. I, I mean that's I, that's above my pay grade because I got four lessons to plan for tomorrow, so right. I got to get home. <laughs> I, I understand, I, and I appreciate you staying. Like sure. I said, um, I just I wasn't sure where I I see the names written out, and I yeah. I'm familiar with the majority of the teachers, uh -huh. but I don't know their first names because we always call them by right. Mr. Messenger. Well, you know, I I come so. when my kid was on the soccer team. You know, I'd walk down, hey Bob, hey Stan, hey Mr. Messenger, from the parents because yes. nobody knows my so it's Blaze. Right, so. I know I knew your name was Blaze. <laughs> But some of the others I'm not familiar with, but so it just to get an understanding of where I this I think they took the teacher and moved them up to seventh and eighth for that larger class that's now at the high school. Well, that's not that. Uh, no, they did not. They the, because they've always had eight. They did not need an additional t teacher uh, when the big one came through. The big one came yeah, through that's, that's when the big class came through. They did not add a position because they didn't need to because they had the flexibility. Right. Because their class sizes were were okay. smaller. So, okay. The new teacher would be mainly for social studies, and the benefit of well, having the new teacher well, would be for f it, focus. It would be for it, no, it would be for everything because it would it reduce our class, class sizes. sizes. Right. But we go from so the as I said, seventh and eighth grade are down to eighteen per class. It is a much more reasonable size. I can get to those kids. You know, I teach math, and there are kids who you know yeah. who come in with 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 a with garlic to you know. And, and what to <laughs> come in hating math. math so, um, <laughs> yeah. so uh, you know, there are kids who really struggle, I and that. and I cannot with twenty five kids, I'm having trouble reaching everybody, and I worry every. I mean, I do. I go home. I I, I walk my dog. I say, oh, how am I going? What am I going to do with this kid? When am I going to get a chance to go over this with them? So it's not just focus. I mean, the focus helps, but we can't. The focus doesn't have any advantage if I've got 25 kids but in the to, class. To, to, the, main the main reason is to add another social studies teacher so you can focus on your math or whatever. Yes, you and, 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 and lower not, my class sizes lower because class you sizes take that social result. studies that yes, I now have then four. You have another class I have another class. And you could split those kids up so in another class. Focus is a benefit. Right. But, we can it, only, but it's, but it's only a benefit if, if my class sizes are, are smaller. Right. Okay. Otherwise, I, I'm treading, treading water. Okay. John, do you have a comment? We're yeah, we were well, two, two would be optimal, absolutely, because with one we still have to juggle things around. But I understand, you know, so as a many, taxpayer, yeah, I, have, I understand that. I funds have two are, in there. Um, you will see in two weeks um, what's happened as we are looking at numbers, and I don't like, you know, I will present to you a, a, what I believe is a fiscally responsible um, budget, but I also will show you how I got to that budget and what needed to be cut in order to get there and what will happen because of those cuts or what can potentially happen. Um, and it's there's so many benefits, Catherine. It's, um, we look at, obviously, our students always first, but the, 
the benefits of what the teachers will get out of it too because they are planning for so many different subject areas that they're they're the um it's we're running it similar to an elementary model and we can but it doesn't mean it's the best it's the best for our students no it isn't the best for our students um which is why we we can't do it in seventh eighth grade it's illegal that's why we don't <laughs> that's why we don't um so they they also need time um to be able to work together to be able to prep um so if they're prepping for every single thing and like we explained earlier the intensity of grade six um it's it's very different than grade one or two um, it's it's hard to teach kids how to read believe me um but it's it's different when it comes to content and skills so we could benefit in many different ways not just intervention not just social studies it's with teacher time it's with everything um it's there's just so many more there'll be so many that more benefits and if i could add one more thing the reason that i got my picture taken with the president um was not how i teach dividing fractions it was how i make and uh, tell me if i'm wrong here hunter the connection i make with the kids yes. yeah and that's time and if i don't have, have that many kids and not that much time I can't make that connection, which is why I got in this in this racket to begin with, because I saw what teachers did for my kid, and I said, "Look what they did for him. I can go help other people." I, and so if I if I can't help the people that need help, it may, it, it it's tough. Having two kids who have gone through sixth grade, um, who have had social studies teachers that have also taught mm -hmm. their specialty was science, or mm -hmm. their specialty was something. One of them actually had Mrs. Delarada because they're in the large mm -hmm. class. Okay. The other one did not and sat through one teacher's classroom for flex social studies and science. He was in there for an hour and a half, mm. which yeah. defeats the purpose right. of middle school. Exactly. And the, so I just wanted to make sure that I under, I became confused after the presentation from Mrs. Okay. Cochiola and I just wanted to make sure it was right. clear on all the reasonings yeah, I, and the, okay. that's why I had the question. I don't disagree with it. Yeah, no, it's, I just had a lot it, of questions. It really, I mean, and we didn't, you don't see the impact until you live it. And so we didn't see this impact, um, how it impact, you know, it, it, it has layers like Shrek and the onion. It, it, <laughs> it, 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 it the ripples keep coming out and, and we're, we had a discussion, we were talking about this in, in the sixth grade team last week. And you know what else, you know, so, I mean, that there are still things that we're finding that make our job more difficult because there's only six of us. Right. Any other questions or comments so. for Mr. Blaze Messenger? Jen. I just want to also thank you for staying. Um, I've just heard from a lot of families that that tra transition from WIS to the mm -hmm. sixth grade is a really difficult one, and a lot of students do struggle with it. Mm -hmm. So if we can reduce the, the class size to give them that time and the support, I think it's a really good decision. I, I thank you, and I, I, I would I would second you on that if you want to write that <laughs> just, just to give you credit when my child was going into middle school they had you as their primary it, teacher this is were... bridget yes yes took a huge relief off because the okay. reputation was there oh okay so well was very happy uh, well i hopefully uh, to be but then, comfortable was it still there at the end of the year <laughs> you know that's the thing it was okay. All right. it was so I, and, and yeah, I tell the kids who help me for both math and social studies, I'm sorry, you're going to hear the same jokes twice. So, you know. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? You need to have Hunter divide some fractions for us. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. I'm happy to do as much calculus as you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, you were doing that in fifth grade as well. <laughs> that was Trig. A trig? Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, Blake. thank much you. Much appreciated. You. Now, do I need to stay to the very end or can I? You can go, you win. All right, thank you. Um, okay. Um, Public comment. Uh, topics for future agendas. My only comment is for January 28th. Um, if it's not urgent, it shouldn't be on there. Just the, the budget. Thing, the only thing that we're putting on is the, are the policies so we can move them forward. And, yep. and everyone's going to vote yes, and we're going to move forward, especially Mr. Flanders, and then we're going to go right into the budget. <laughs> okay. Um, Any other topics anyone wants to add to future agendas? Those are just informational. Yep. No action. If you have questions, let us know. But. Those will be, and we, I move those to the bottom of new business, so they'll always be there as informational. We'll never do anything with them, but if you have questions after you re reviewed your packet, just raise them. Now or later? Yes, go ahead. Oh. Okay. Yep. Um, I was just, oh, sorry. excuse me, uh, wondering what the difference is between a daily substitute teacher, a building sub teacher, 
Um, there was like three different ones. Buildings, yeah. Daily and long term. Daily and then at long term I got, I guess, just difference between daily substitute teacher and then building subteacher. Sure. So, um, and then substitute teacher for district. Yeah, there's three yeah. different ones. Looking for um, ways that we can save money for this year. So, for example, we know um, through historical data that we are going to have at least three to five teachers out. We only had eight subs on our sub when we started this year. Michelle, now we now have 32. If, Woo, if, anyone, like if anyone needs to leave for family uh, care reasons or otherwise, please feel free. As long as we keep five here, we're good for adjourning. So we had, um, we, we <laughs> were paying teachers to cover classes because we couldn't get, we can't get subs. When you give a person a building job, uh, building sub position, they know that they have full-time employment. So it's more likely that they're going to show up and it's less likely that we're gonna have class coverage. So when you have a teacher who's covering a class, we're paying them, I don't know if it's, it's 26 or 35, I forget, I'm sorry, the exact rate. Um, so that multiply that by the teacher having to teach six classes and you're getting up towards $200. So if you have a building sub, you're always going to use that building sub and we're paying that sub $100 a day. So that's what a building sub is. If um, I, I, you'll see the budget in, in a couple of weeks, but if I had it my way, I would even add one more to um, the high school and I would make one district wide but that was a floater um, but I don't want to do that just yet because I haven't worked out all the numbers um, a, a daily sub is just someone who comes in and yeah that's your typical sub um, we are up to uh, like I said we went from 8 to 31 or 32 in the district Michelle is hired that's what she's been doing um, so we're in a good place um, but remember those people are on other people's lists too, so they go to wherever they get called first. A daily sub comes to us every single day, um, building sub. The district-wide sub, so for example, that falls m more under um, law, uh, a district-wide sub and the daily sub really are the same, so I don't know why they're split into it. I have to look into that more because it is really the same thing. Selena. Super quick, I yeah. But just, do you have any idea how she increased our pool to 32, or do you might not want to ask killing herself. that right now? <laughs> well, we, <laughs> did, we did raise Lots. the... Lots. We, we raised it. That she, yeah. Yeah. Oh, she, oh. yeah, we raised it. She, um, Michelle has, um, has it posted everywhere you can possibly imagine. Um, she goes through applications weekly, gets people in very quickly, um, screens them, gets them on board. So she's she's a magician at some of this stuff. So which is why we wanted her. <laughs> um, one other thing, and, and I didn't note this, and maybe we could just spike this out on future informational HR personnel activities on the agenda. Let's spike out any retirements separately, and then include their letters like we, we have typically done. Oh, you want their letters? Yeah. Cry. Yeah. No, exactly. But <laughs> so uh, under human resources, personal activity in the future, just list those out and then attach their letters. And if you could share both their letters um, with us in the meantime for this this folks. So I just like to take a moment because these are um, two very prominent and longtime members of our school team. Uh, Pam Grandy, our um, school nurse supervisor, Edna C. Stevens, um, has been with us since 95 and is retiring as of July 31st. Um, <clears throat> particularly for folks who've been on the board a little while. She has been a regular uh, um, a regular participant at board meetings to share uh, policies and, and issues and the like, um, and just one of the people, I think, who has continually really expressed her and shown her compassion and love for our students uh, very powerfully and very regularly. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, as I've said to her, I don't, I've not always agreed with her. We've had some very passionate discussions and debates around certain issues. Um, but I have always respected her, admired her, and thought very highly of her, and she will be um, be missed um, dearly. So we certainly wish her the best. And uh, um, even longer tenured, one of our longest tenured teachers in the district, uh, Miss Petrosky, um, who um, you know has uh, was our uh, mayor's uh, math teacher many years ago, and has been around. And My yours? Oh, your husband? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so been around here with us since 1979, um, and just a 
a truly outstanding math teacher. You know, to Blaze's comment about how math scares people, she has been a, uh, a person who, even those kids, she helps and, and really helps get them uh, where they need to be and uh, just a, a fantastic person. Um, not only a great math teacher, but a great person who's um, always had her students' interests at heart first. And um, you know how many people who have been been with her through the years and and still think about her very fondly. Um, so it uh, just a uh, a treasure and an institution for our district. Um, what's 1979? How many years is that? That's I'm, I'm struggling with the math. 40, 40 years. Um, 41. 41. So uh, a hell of a tenure, and uh, likewise, she will be very deeply missed and wish uh, her uh, the absolute best in, in her retirement as well. So I just wanted to, I know it's late, but important for two of our very uh, important team members. And we've gotten to more since then, and it's, it's sad too. It's people that, there. you talk about people, and we all say, oh, we can all be replaced. Um, they're gems listening to people talk about them is incredible and we've gotten um two more because of the january 15th you know deadline they might as well get to the two thousand dollars which is helpful to us too um but two more um who have been here for a very long time and they have been amazing teachers the entire time or nurses that they've been here um i've just gotten to know them over the last six months and i'm like don't go <laughs> i'll throw your thing in the shredder um but they have done a phenomenal, phenomenal job, and we will celebrate them. Um, those two just came in yesterday, so we'll okay. have those on the next. We'll put those agenda. on the next agenda and include yeah. their letters, and then we'll circulate the two letters for, for these two ladies as well. Um, so you just said might you said break it down by retirement. Yeah. So where we have on the agenda where it says human resource personnel activity. Yep. Just underneath that, if there's any retirements, put their put a Got it. you know Pam Grandy, and then attach the letters. Um, List retirement. List requirements and attach and their letters. letters okay. Um, any other topics for future agendas? Hearing none. Uh, comments, updates, and announcements from board members and administrators. So I'll go around the table. Dipti? Jen? Selena? None? Enza? Jeff? Lori? Hunter? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Just, I went to the open house for the high school. Uh, scary but um, <laughs> I don't like saying that but we did and it was good so the they did a leagues. good job yeah yeah it's nice to hear Hunter <coughs> anything from you Tommy Alessandra anything from you okay is there a motion to adjourn we have a motion from John a second from second from who Jeff. second from Jeff all in favor Aye. opposed abstention motion carries we adjourn 934 Thank you, guys. Yeah.